Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 352, The Dark Knight Returns, part 2. Welcome to Raging Bullets, I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm always joined by my co-host, Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, and the Duke of You Know. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we are going to cover issues three and four of The Dark Knight Returns, a very big story with uh, a lot of themes in there that I've really enjoyed discussing with you because we come at them a lot of times from different places based on our original experience with this series, and I think it's just really terrific. So I'm glad to have a chance to finish up this discussion with you. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts. Sponsoring us this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, I wanted to shout this out. You know, a lot of times we talk about the comics and trades, single issues, floppies, all kinds of stuff that you can pre-order from DCBService.com. One of the things I never shout out is things like statues. They have the Batman black and white Batman statue by Greg Capolo. They also have the Batman black and white Joker statue by Greg Capolo. These are regularly seventy nine ninety five. They're thirty two percent off, only fifty four thirty seven. If you're looking to do like statue pre orders and things like that, if you're one of those people that like like me, like to every so often get some swag along with your purchases, be sure to check out DCBService.com. Remember, they are a digital partner. Every time you make a digital purchase, five percent of that goes towards your DCB service order. Over at InStockTrades.com, this is near and dear to my heart. I have always been a big fan of the new Teen Titans by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. They have the Omnibus, Volume 3. This is a $75 book that's 50% off, only $37.49. It's 792 pages. It collects Tales of the Teen Titans 45 to 61 and 66 to 67, New Teen Titans 38, New Teen Titans 1 through 6, and Secret Origins Annual number 3. This is a great way, if you haven't been picking up uh, the New Teen Titans, if you've been looking to jump on this incredible run, this is an amazing way to pick it up. And at that 50% off at $37.49, you're just getting an amazing deal. So I wanted to shout out InStockTrades.com, and I want to thank both of those companies for continuing to support our show. James, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on the show. So, if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk Dark Knight Returns. You filthy criminals. So, Jim, back to Dark Knight Returns with issue number three. It's, I don't know what it is, but this cover in particular has always been one that I've enjoyed. And it's kind of like, it's an interesting, I don't want to, I don't know if minimalist is the trait, you know, because it's just the bat symbol and then carry in the corner. But there was just something cool about it. I think what it was is by this issue of the series, I was really invested in Carrie Kelly as a character. I don't know if you have that experience with her, but for me, oh, actually, we talked about that the last yeah. episode that you didn't, do you feel differently about her now? Oh, dramatically. It, <clears throat> actually, I want to clarify something because I had um, I confused some people and I got a couple emails. Okay. And I figured there's probably more people who didn't email me you know, who had the same confusion. When I talk about my experience with Dark Knight um, Returns, there's three different periods. There's, so there's three different gyms out there. There's the gym who first read this a, a while ago, bef- the pre-podcast gym. There's the gym who started re- who reread it for the show and then there's the current you know how I currently feel after reading studying watching the movie going back and just the prep and just the uh, study and the analysis of the characters and whatnot so there's three very distinct different people the the very the, the very first Jim you know really had no investment in Carrie and just saw her as just oh, okay whatever didn't recognize the importance of her the you know when i first got back into this reading i was like oh okay yeah i i thought she was a cool character and i thought things were kind of neat about her you know especially because i had more experience with other robins and i saw the different dynamics and you know just the you know just as i said there was an there's an iconic nature to this story so i was like oh okay but the gym currently is very heavily invested in Carrie. I think she's an absolute wonderful Robin. I, I put her on the same level that I put with uh, Tim and Damien. 
And those are, you know, some of my top Robins. So it's, she's definitely is one of those characters that I really, you know, like, appreciate, love, and just, you know, I've got, uh, you know, very definite vested interest in her. It's funny how over the life of doing the show, this is one of those stories that I haven't read as much as I thought I would have reread it. I think it was because we've, you know, more when we've done these things, we've like kind of gone after longer stories, like, you know, long Halloween and things like that. Revisiting this one, these are the two issues where we start going into the whole Superman bit. The story takes like a dramatic turn. We, you know, we st- and the Joker stuff and things like that. But Superman's introduction starts to become very early in this third issue as, as more of a larger player in this storyline. What did you think about the whole Ronald Reagan, Superman, the idea that heroes were kind of retired at this point, a majority of them, or for, actually forced into retirement? What did you think about that whole stance? What did you think about, you're a Superman guy. What was your take on Superman in this story? Yeah, my, oh man, Superman's another one of the characters in here that I've had dramatic changes in how I looked at it and how I saw the story. When I first read it, I was I was a little pit. I was a little yeah, I was a little angry at the uh, you know at the the big blue boy scout because I was like, "Come on, man, Clark, you know better than this." You know, Mon Pa Kent raised you better than uh, you know to do this type of stuff. And I on one hand, and you know when I was first reading, I was like, ah. you know, and I I accepted it because of how everything ended. I was like, oh, "Okay, he's kind of back." You know, Superman's a little bit. Clark's there's still glimmers of Clark there. Okay, but you know, when I was first reading this, I was very angry at Clark at how he was handling it. The fact that he was, you know, letting himself be used by the U.S. government. He was doing the things that I never thought Clark should have or would have done. And when I reread this the first time, I completely read it differently, just because I could understand why Clark would do what he would do. He was in his mind, he was doing the greater good. You know, with uh, the public opinion turning against the heroes, he knew eventually it would be open manhunt. And he knew that the heroes, if they didn't voluntarily go away, if they didn't go into hiding like they did, you know, they, they would their lives, their families' lives, anybody associated with them would be ruined. And this was Clark's way of protecting his friends as well as continuing to help uh, the public, uh, you know, the general public. So I had a definite different opinion the second time and present read throughs that than I did when I first opened up the book and cracked it. But it it's still part of me doesn't part of me is a little upset that Clark would let this happen, but it's again, I, I understand why he's doing it. I understand his motivation and I understand why someone would have to you know, someone with his powers, his responsibilities would go ahead and do what he did. What about the Ollie Queen situation with Clark? Now that's the one where I always have issues. I, well, I, I kind of have issues with. I kind of don't know. You know, when we see Ali, he's got one arm. Clark shot off the other arm, correct? Yeah. Okay, that's the that's where I have the issues with. Um, I can't I can't see Clark torching off the arm. Yeah, and I, I don't remember what the backs to see. And this is where I don't remember if in strikes again that's ever addressed. Because Ali appears in both stories. I thought it was, I thought the references were that he he refused to stand down. Right. Bruce retired, but Ali refused. And he's like, no, I'm not going to. And so Art Clark said, eh, you're going to. <laughs> and zapped his arm. That's what I was thinking, too. Um, I, I, being honest, I haven't read Strikes Again yet. You know, reread it for the purpose of... Uh, you know, our story, what we're doing right now. Yeah. Um, I focused on doing another re- run through of r- returns and then obviously year one uh, multiple times. So I- I've been kind of, I don't know, you have, have you read Strikes Again since? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I honestly, I'm trying to remember, I don't think they ever flat out lay, I don't think that I, I'm re- trying to remember it. I don't think they flat out said, this is what happened. Yeah. Like, I don't think they gave the details. It was all just implied that it was Clark who took the arm. It's it's an interesting story there, because that's the one area, I think the Ollie, for some reason, I guess the fact that Clark's a hero, and Ollie's a hero, I, I how do you attack another leaguer? Uh, but, you know, again, i got to remember that this is the Millerverse, right. and that kind of makes, it's funny, even more so now than back in the day, because back in the day, I wanted to see Batman whoop his butt. 
and I was a big Batman guy at the time. I wasn't anti Superman. I always loved Superman. I loved the movies. I, I was actually it was a, you know I've mentioned many times on the show John Burns Man of Steel. You know that kind of reinvigorated my interest in Superman when when that series launched. It wasn't that I did I didn't like the character prior to that. It was more of a when that mini series launched. I was a fan of John Burns art. So I'm like, oh, kind of cool. See John Byrne do a whole little Superman thing. So that drew me into reading Superman again and made me, you know, kind of remember, oh, Superman's cool. He's got a great supporting cast, all this other fun stuff. So, you know, that was kind of the motivation there. But I remember when I was reading this and I was I was really looking forward to seeing Batman one up Superman. And <laughs> hoping that that's exactly how it would happen. I, I do like how their relationship goes. Let's jump to that. We've got, um, what, Nazi lady? Yeah. Uh, uh, Bruno? Bruno. Yeah, Bruno versus... Um, A very stupid clerk, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, you know what? I'm, there's, I, I don't generally say, generally root for people to be shot and killed, you know, in... Wow. Well, I kind of do. I kind of <laughs> do sometimes. Okay, yeah, I can't say I generally don't, but... Yeah, no, it's not right for me to say that. How about that? But this guy's got it coming. You know, he's sitting there. He's got a machine gun pointed at his head, and he is mocking the person holding the machine gun. Now, he's betting on the fact that he's got, uh, you know, a revolver hidden in the counter, and he's hoping he can get to that revolver. But you know what? That's still a very stupid thing for him to do. You you say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, what can I get you, ma'am? Would you like that in paper or plastic? Here, let me help you load your car for you. And then while you're reaching for the paper and plastic, that's when you grab the gun, and that's when you shoot her. You know, not while you're sitting there taunting her and tormenting her. I liked Batman's disguise. I've always liked that aspect of Batman, the fact that it gathering information... Being able to be in places where you're unseen isn't limited to the shadows of the outside. There's an advantage in the interiors to wearing disguises and outfits. And I like that it's not just Matches Malone. Yeah. You know, I love Matches Malone. I like the idea that he's you know, developed that kind of underworld persona. So that works for me. It always has. But stuff like this is something I really enjoy, too. Dressing up as this you know, old lady, beggar, whatever you want to call her. And, and using that as a way to get close and for them not to feel threatened by her. It is kind of funny to see her throwing batarangs. <laughs> yeah. And not only throwing batarangs, just completely smacking around uh, Rob and Don, you know, Rob and Don and, you know, Ron and Don or Rob and Don, whatever those two knuckleheads' names are. But I really like the fact that when the clerk, you know, when Bruno, when the, the thugs are down, the clerk's like, okay, now we settle up. But he's, th- he's getting all thinking he's all tuck tough and bruce is like pull that trigger i'll be back for you and just doesn't miss a beat even though these are the bad guys even though these are the thugs who are killers guess what you're still not allowed to take the life i like that i really did what do you think of carrie's defiance from time to time of bruce where where like you know bruce will say don't let her see you but it's really the things carrie are doing they're actually good things yeah. Like, she's doing things to distract Bruno to keep, you know, Bruno from getting away. Different things like that. Um, almost leading Bruno into a position where Bruno can be taken down by Bruce. So, I, I think what she's doing in all cases has been good. But what do you think of that? I know you're usually one about, you know, kind of going more by the book and things like that. But I think her improvisation has proven her to be more effective as a Robin. I actually, that's why I I connect her in many ways to what I like about Tim Drake. She's an independent entity, but not a stupid one. Oh, big time. I completely agree with that last statement, because that's some of the strengths that Tim had, that's some of the strengths Damien had, and even, you know, Dick Grayson, all the Robins. You have to have that individual style. You have to, it's, you gotta follow orders, and you gotta do your job, but... You can't, it's not the, when you're in the field like that, you can't just be completely have the blinders on. And with the funny thing with this one is Bruce's orders were to get her into the alley. Don't, do not let her see you. Well, she gets her, she gets her into the alley and unfortunately she sees her. But part of me was like, it could have been just more of a lack of training that got, she got caught. She's not used to the shadow movement. She's not used to fighting in the shadows. If she had been more in the shadows when she shot the um, the stone, you know, used the slingshot, then you know maybe that would have worked better for her. But it's part of it isn't just complete defiance, but part of it I think is a lack of training and a lack of experience. That because 
you know, for her to do the sneak attack on Bruno, she's still visible. Oh, oh got to move. And, you know, so it was the, re- the attack, and then she had to stick and move and go into hiding. And she didn't go try to go one-on-one, toe-to-toe with Bruno. You know, it's funny. After that whole situation plays out, the, one, of my, one of those sequences of speaking of people that you want to see get beat up, the guy in the subway. Yeah. The guy who knocked over the guy with the, cl- you know, with the crutches. They never show you that until they're ready to kill you. You know, about him having a gun. Yeah. Oh, sure, the crutches. A lot of them use crutches, you know what I mean? I mean, he started it, and it was his crutches that tripped him up, even though we see the guy clearly pushing him. <laughs> I actually like that this is framed with what actually happened. Oh, definitely. Because there's an irony to seeing this guy on television speaking like, you know, he's clearly in the innocent, and this other guy's totally at fault. When we know that, like, this is really somebody who needed the crutches, couldn't defend himself in any way, shape, or form, and this guy did him in. Yeah. And it's, you get, it's funny because you get a lot of just apathy when you're in, like, the really big cities like that, and you get moments. You know, you would think you would get people who would run up and say, oh, let me save you, but you'll get a lot of people who, you know, even present day, well, someone would trip or fall on the track, instead of reaching out a hand to pull them up, they're pulling out their cell phone, getting it on camera. Oh, I got to get this, you know, upload, tweet this, you know, instead of actually doing something and stepping up. And you get the little sniveling, you know, people like this guy. And it was, I kind of appreciated the fact that you had the little tone in your voice when you're talking, when you're actually reading his lines, because I can, you know, I had the exact same feeling, sentiment on the guy, and you really wanted to see this dude get a nice little beat down, but... You know, it's again. You know, you know, should we should we actually sit there and say, yeah, smack the guy around a little bit? But uh, you know, maybe I don't know. It's um, it's one of those weird things about this story that when we start jumping around these different people, we are immediately getting the signs and symptoms of you know of who Gotham is. I think that's wonderful that you know in these couple panels we're getting this view, we're getting this understanding of the city you know already, and it's we got a strong comfort level with us that. Neither one of us are surprised by this. Neither one of us said, oh, I don't know about that. We all were both like had the exact same reaction. So it's kind of a, this is a cool environment that's been laid out for us. I like that the whole thing leads to our first introduction to Superman actually being here. You yeah. know, he's been tasked with trying to put a stop to the situation with Bruce. And, you know, Clark's obviously there with the purpose of, can we talk this out? I like the idea that these two know each other well enough to know Bruce knows what Clark's there for. Clark's knows what Bruce's reaction is going to be. He's doing it anyway out of professional respect and courtesy. But you know, deep down, both of them know they're eventually going toe to toe, knowing that the days that they can avoid that are slowly coming to an end. I like that. There's something about that because I do consider them to be characters that clearly have always had two different philosophies. I quite like it. Um, the, The respect is what pulls them together. But what makes them the world's finest team to me is the differences. Yeah. And that's something that here, I think, stands out in this piece. Even though there's, like you, there's moments with Superman where I really don't agree with what he did. In that one, I do. Oh, definitely. This was this was some classic uh, Superman moments. And you get some, you, again, it's that true. This is a, what part of the thing that it was like a real true feeling towards Clark. And I think, you know, seeing these moments and then seeing him later kind of, betray you know the friendship was this thing that always struck me as the court i was like oh man i don't know about this because we got this glimpse of clark trying to talk him down trying to figure this out and we do get the fact that clark saves the the guy on the track by you know with his hands and the he though he's you know sticking to the shadows because it was great how the newsstand guy is talking about the wisp past and the news reporter is like faster than a speeding bullet careful lola we don't want trouble with the the fcc you know and they're just you know, alluding to who's out there, alluding to what this is, but they still got to keep it secret. They still got to keep it quiet. So it was just this whole subtle introduction of Clark into this universe. This whole, you know, just hidden in the shadows. He's not out in public like he used to always be. So these are some great just indicators on what was going to happen, what's going to come down the line, because Clark isn't dun da da flying in there, big blue Boy Scout, bright light shining of hope for everybody. No, he's sticking to the shadows. He's doing is uh he's kind of doing a bat thing where it's it's not out in the open in public. You know, this gets to another one of my favorite spread pages. The one with uh, Batman swinging and Carrie in front of him. Yeah. I mean, what a great shot. What I loved about that one is you've got Bruce with the stern facial expression. You know, that's the kind of the Batman we're all used to now anyway. But Carrie's sense of hope and wonder, 
the contrast of the two, I just think makes it a beautiful piece. You know, she's the one that you get why he needs Robin, you know, and what she really brings to the table there. And that's what I, I've always had a soft spot for her as a character because of moments like that where you see that. That, to me, is what Robin should be. Yeah. Well, we saw some of those great moments, you know, with uh, Tim. We saw some of those moments with uh, Damien and Bruce. We saw mm-hmm. you see that that light, you know, when the light and the darkness swinging together. And, uh, you know, we always used to we would comment on how Robin always had the big smile on his face as he's swinging. Every Robin had that. Even Damien sometimes would have a, a little bit of a grin on his face. And Bruce always had the stern look. And it was it was always a neat combo and a neat uh, you know duality to it. Now, my question for you: When we're comparing movie and comics, uh-huh. this whole op- this whole sequence, this opening introduction of Clark, did you have a preference on either one? Which one you thought looked better? Because in the movie, we actually do see more of Clark's image. As opposed to we really he really stays to the shadows the whole time, you know, in the comic. No. Other than I, I like the idea that he was so fast at this point. See, to me, one of the things I've always enjoyed in, in Superman storytelling when they deal with a future version of Superman is this idea that after years of being Superman and after years of absorbing the sun's energy and stuff like that, that he's somehow just a little bit more powerful. You know, so this idea that he's so much faster now that like he's hard to see. There's something about that that I like. I really kind of enjoy that idea for Clark. So that part of it in the comic I like, but I, I'm saying that only because you asked the question. To, to be honest, when I was watching either version, I was like, do I prefer one or the other? Not really. I like them both. Um, the film version was great to see it come to life, but I wasn't like when I was watching that going, oh my gosh, this is so much better than the comic. Uh, and, and vice versa. I just, I think both, they, they complement each other well, they're really cool scenes, and I don't really have a problem with it. Yeah, see, on my, my, second re- my second watching is where I really started noticing a lot of these differences. And that was the thing where I noticed, I was because I was sitting there like, ah, you know, and on one hand, I really did like, you know, when I was reading the comic, how we never actually saw him at this point. I thought that was kind of neat that he was doing pure shadow movement you know, as compared to how he used to operate in the light. But there was those, that was a really cool visual scene where when Bruno's firing and you can see him, his frame, you can see the bullets bouncing off him. Here, she's shooting into the shadows and she's shooting in the darkness and you're getting, you know, the reflection off of the shadows, but you're not actually seeing him. And for me, I kind of liked seeing a shadowy type version of Clark getting hit by the bullets. It was just, it was something kind of neat where it was the whoosh and whoosh and boom and all those, the super speed up to this moment. Okay, here's the big reveal. I liked it. It was, it kind of struck a chord as, and I remembered the differences between the two. Yeah, it was, it's really uh, just kind of a neat experience. I, I saw the differences. Um, you actually, I, I, obviously you thought that through more than I did. And I, I really like your explanation of it. Jim Gordon's retirement was interesting because yeah. you see the two of them more established at this point. You know, when you see Jim Gordon kind of doing this speech, it's almost like he's trying to set up Gotham in a way to let them know what's coming and hopefully for them to find some hope in Batman being there, which is something that I enjoy in that moment. You know, the fact that he's trying to take care of his friend. Yeah, that was a cool speech. You know, that was Gordon, you know, doing the right thing. Yeah. He didn't make it all about him. He didn't make it all about, you know... This was about the the passing of the torch. This was just about that that statement and that last piece of advice that he was going to give to his successor. I think he could have very easily gone a, a jerk route with this and said, "Hey, you know, we need this guy." He really could have laid out his argument, could have really laid out why he did what he did and why she should continue on his path. But he's like, you know what? You got to figure this out for yourself. You got to see what he's about. You got to, you know, you'll learn eventually what it is, you know, and what he brings to this table. And I thought those were like kind of a cool moments for him. You know, it's, he said his goodbyes, he's, you know, done and he's moving on. And she did the exact same thing. She did the right thing, in my opinion, that she had to do this. This is something she couldn't come in being completely owned up to Gordon and what Gordon's policies. She saw Batman as a threat. She saw him as a menace. And guess what? When you see the threat, when you see the menace, you gotta issue the police warrant. You gotta list, list, you got to release the arrest warrant. You gotta, you know, go after him. Now, 
you know, we see eventually she learns, okay, what Bruce brings to the table and what the bat is all about, and she learns the path. But initially, this is the correct act, course of action for her, and it was a very decisive maneuver, and it was something she really needed to do. Yeah, I, I don't really have an issue with her. Um, as the story went on, I, I actually liked her mind gradually opening. I kind of have more respect for her that she's not a drone. Exactly. Oh, definitely. Which I think is interesting. So it's it's a it's a fun character, uh, which I I be, I found her to be believable. Which sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, where you've got characters that are like just this automatically. Uh, come in and they they hate Batman and they're now they're going to be the one to bring down Batman and they've got to somehow I li- here's what I liked about it she isn't corrupt she's coming in she's trying to do the job the right way she's finding what she considers to be a flaw in Gordon's policy she's trying to fix it F- through her interactions with Batman kind of winds up in a similar place that Gordon does in year one where she has to realize that hey maybe we do need this guy I liked. Um, and I know I'm jumping ahead of this, and we can kind of gloss over the time. I remember in the film, one of the sequences I liked is when Batman came in with his little army. Yeah, yeah. And, and she's like, you know, he's too big. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was great. Well, she's a character that she's another character that difference between first, you know, my the initial read through, and now when I first you know read her, I saw her as the oh come on. Why are you going after Batman? This is the Batman. What are you nuts? And I really saw her as just, okay, she's a politician. She's playing the political game, man. And I really completely misjudged her 100%. And part of it is now my actual experience dealing with, you know, law enforcement, actually dealing with people who've had, you know, not similar situations because we don't have, you know, vigilantes running around. But there are people when you're stepping into a you know, position of authority, stepping into an already established, well established uh you know, command. And she's gotta do her own thing. She's gotta handle it her own way and she's gotta approach it, you know, with strength and conviction. And I can I'm sitting here now I'm reading this, I'm like, man, she's cool. She's a cool character. And she's one of those that by the end of um, my all my read-throughs in the movies and whatnot, I really like this character as well. She she was always the you know the female commissioner who replaced Gordon to me. Now I actually know you know her name and you know I got a groove to who she's about. I like the Joker thing where the Joker can't s- sleep. Sometimes it's great to get into his head. Yeah, you know, and and I like that it doesn't always have to be insanity. If you know what I mean, I'm not saying that like he's sane in this moment, but you know sometimes you there's writers who feel that it always has to be incoherent Joker, you know, where he's almost so crazy that you're like, does he ever turn it off? I like in this case that even though he's a more mature Joker, you know, just can't sleep, should sleep, should be fresh tomorrow. Tomorrow I go free, but I just can't sleep. And you you know that like a whole bunch of crazy is probably going through his head about things to do with Batman and stuff, but I just kind of like that it's more of a tranquil moment with the Joker because you don't get many of those. No. Yeah, and he's he's getting ready for some crazy, and this was, again, this was a really cool moment of the setup and just the anticipation of the carnage. And the other thing I noticed dramatically was the dolls that Abner has. In the comic, they're very rude and crude and crass sounding. In the movie, they kept them pretty much silent to avoid him them saying you know nasty stuff. I kind of like the silent dolls. I thought you know because you know it it added to just the creep factor of them keeping them quiet. I agree with that. I I, I kind of like both versions, and I I'm, it's not even to contradict you. I thought the film handled them we were right with a creep, and I, I thought. With the dialogue in the comic, because they're stationary, you know, they're not really moving, the dialogue kept the creep factor. Like, I think the creepiness is the key of what you need to get out of that experience, and it worked on in both experiences. Uh, whereas in the one where, you know, there was audio, you're right, it, it was even more creepy that they were not speaking there. Right. Whereas I don't feel like they're diminished for having dialogue in the printed version. Yeah, now, and it was funny with Robin disobeying and almost getting blown up. It, to me, that was a classic uh, early Robin, you know, and, you know, just that the impetuous, just the over eager, you know, just the impetuous. Youth of, thank you, impetuous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I went to say, and I started stumbling at it, so I said, ah, I'll just skip the word. <laughs> but yeah, you know, that for me is always also a classic Robin moments where you get 
just that you know, young and stupid, where they do something like that because they're not thinking two steps ahead because they're like, hey, quick, let's go, rah! You know, like, no, hold on, boom! I like with Superman when we see him and Bruce with the meeting of the behind, so yeah. to speak, and you get that like really iconic looking. That's like I, I know you're kind of into the true justice. Amer- I know not kind of. I, mean, I know you're definitely into the true justice American way, like I do. That visual right there is that to me. It doesn't matter that he's in Clark mode with the Fabio look going on. Yeah, you know, it's still <laughs> there's something about that that he looks like this American ideal, which is is an element of Superman to me. I'm not talking about even from a country standpoint. I'm just saying that he looks like that template of what everybody should want to be. And that's neat. Well, and even in the movie, they did it one step further, actually showing the eagle landing on his hand and whatnot. Whereas here, you have the the scene where he's standing there, and then the next panel, it's the eagles flying away. So I did kind of chuckle at that and i was like yeah and, yeah watching on they're really going heavy hardcore hoorah america and i liked it and i like the fact that these two are trying you know they're trying well clark's trying to work this out he's trying not to make this uh violence he's trying not to have you know this come to physical because in his mind he's thinking bruce you have no chance i will have to kill you and i don't want to kill you because he knows bruce won't back down but he's trying to just Hopefully he can appeal to his sense of duty. Hopefully he can appeal to something in Bruce. Just that last remaining bit of logic that will say, don't do this. And, you know, I like just that last-ditch effort and this last meeting of these two friends. Now, I really do like Ronald Reagan. them using, well, the characterizations of him in this. I thought that was actually very cool. And just there's enough drawings of him that it looks, you can tell that he's supposed to be Reagan. But they don't flat out say, hey, this is Ronald Reagan, your president. And there's enough references and hints to who it is but i really like the scene where he's talking about how you know it's looking like nuclear war looking like problem but don't worry we got god on our side or the next best thing a eh? wink and i was just i laughed out loud when i read it i laughed when i saw it on the screen this was just again one of those really cool moments and right then clark's like it hey, gotta go Shoom, and he takes off and this was again really cool moments especially because we get these images of Clark, but it's all shadowy images of Clark with the bright red cape. We still, at this point in time in the comic, haven't seen you know the full costume, haven't seen the full outfit, and I I really do appreciate that look. You know how they went with this because they're not you know really giving us the full images of it. They're showing us enough. We know exactly this is Clark, but it's not completely. You know we're not seeing the Blue Boy Scout. We're not seeing the Clark we know. I liked Batman with the what the hound by him because yeah. a lot of this stuff influenced. Did you watch Batman Beyond at all? Yeah, I watched it. I always felt like it was this Batman. Like I'm, I'm not taking Carrie out of the equation, but I always felt like it was based uh, on this Batman. You know, the Bruce Wayne that he deals with um, somehow felt like this Batman. I don't know if you feel the same way, but to me, it was always this guy, and I liked seeing him on the screen. And maybe that's just, that could be just my <laughs> just my uh, recollection of him, but See, I really I, enjoyed the cartoon. I never got that feeling when really? I was watching. I never thought this is oh this is Dark Knight Returns, you know, Bruce Wayne. The older the watching. older yeah. Batman with the two dogs. And yeah, the, yeah. I never I never got that. I understand why because they have very similar characterizations and personalities and whatnot. But I always just I I always liked Batman Beyond because that seemed like a natural progression for me for Batman. Where he would be retired, he because he's too old to keep going. His body is falling apart. He's been doing it far too long, and I I liked he steps down, but he still has to stay in the game. He still has to do that, and he's you know training Terry and whatnot. But you know I think I see the comparison because both of these the two the two Bruces are very similar in their personality and very similar in their style and their just their mindset. So I definitely you know would say I could see it. I just when I was watching the show, I never had that notion pop in my head. Had you read this when you watched the show? Um, I believe so. Okay. Because I think the very first time I read this was back in college. It was in the 90s. Because I think it was either you or it was my buddy Hoach, you know, in BG, who said, you got to read this story. This is a great story. So I picked up the trade then. So whenever the trade first came out, that's when I, uh, that's when I read the story. I liked the the whole helicopter gadget when that whole sequence came up because 
that led into this assault on the network show. You know, the, what was the name of the show again? I forget. David. It was David something or other. Yeah, because it, it was a parody on the David Letterman show. But Conan O'Brien and Andy Richter were the two hosts on the animated feature. I like that it was Conan O'Brien. Well, I like that, too, because I'm like, you know, one, making it modern day. Two, um, Conan had that whole bit with he did with uh, Bruce Tim. So, you know, Bruce was on his show. So I thought that was kind of neat that they you know went to the guy that they knew and kind of had some dealings with. So I thought that was a kind of a neat moment. I like that the Joker played it straight until he didn't need to anymore or until it served his purposes to finally act out and control and intimidate the situation. Oh, God, yeah. Joker handle, and this was one where both in on page and in the on the you know on the screen that the Joker just had those great moments and that great feel, and I think I liked seeing him on the page just on the um, on the screen because there was so much going on, but you could see them taking page for page and going with the you know using the comic as the direct storyboard leading to those cool moments. So this was one of those things where I was like. This is a great writing of the Joker. This is a cool visualizations of him. This was what I would expect the Joker to do and how I would expect him to handle this. What did you think about him flying away on the doll after the whole thing? You know, when it, when it all went down and the you know Joker went the direction that we all knew he would where he'd kill everybody. <laughs> what did you think about that? You know what? That was the se- that was a sequence that I had uh, issues with. And then I didn't have issues with, and then I did. And I, it was something I kept going back and forth on. Part of me because there was a cheese factor to it where I was like, I don't know about that. But then I'm like, you know what? The Joker's having fun with this. This is now the Joker's letting himself loose. So this is something he would do. This is something that felt true. To, and then once I started getting my grasp on that, I was like, you know what? I don't have a problem with this scene. I think this, you know, and it was one of those things that I was like, this fits the Joker. He massively kills everybody. He, you know, complete homicidal. But the whole time he's sitting there not noticing. There's not, you know, everyone's dying by the laughter. But he's not doing his goofy, ha, 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 you know, you know crazy laugh. You see, I mean, he's got the straight face. This is like he's looking for that humor. He's looking for his smile. And this isn't it. Killing all these people didn't give it to him. And I thought that was a cool moment that we have the Joker who should have been laughing, should have been enjoying himself, but he didn't look like he was. He was looked very serious and very stern. And so when he's even getting carried out by that doll, it still had a very serious nature to him. Yeah, I wasn't saying he was diminished at all by it. I just I found the whole sequence of events interesting. Um, the, the doll thing in particular was one of those. I remember when I was younger reading and going, oh, but I don't think it was a fault necessarily of the windows. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I, you know, it was again. We, I think we had the same kind of uh, groove on that, where you know that initial reaction was very oh cheese. But I, again, as multiple read throughs, is looking into it, I liked it. I thought it was a very appropriate moment. I like the bike with the so- sidecar thing. That's kind of classic Batman too. Like I, normally, I don't like the sidecar because I feel like it makes a bike more clunky and cumbersome. If that makes sense. But for some reason, in this case, it works to kind of see him that be considered their current Batmobile. Oh, God, yeah. And again, it's there was some, you know, you think about it because you figure the Batmobile became the Bat Tank. And did he have another? Did he have something else that he could go with? Or it's just the, the stick and maneuver, you know, stick and move, got to keep it going faster, you know, type of approach. And I was like, OK, that works for me. Now, how did you feel about Bruce attacking the cops? You know, when he was approaching the um, the recording. I liked seeing Superman take charge kind of all over the world because it does kind of fit the two way the two of them are operating. And also seeing where that path ultimately leads for Superman. You know, that while Batman's fighting the good fight in Gotham and, and kind of working his way in through the corruption in Gotham, um, you know, from an underground standpoint, trying to get at the root, find out who's in charge, what's going on. Um, and also finding clever ways to deal with the people that are after him, you know, meaning the police and stuff like that. So he he can try not to hurt anybody in the process. Do you feel that this Batman is more driven about that mission, his, like his current mission in this series, to the point where people he would normally, well, he doesn't really kill anybody until, I mean, obviously, you know, there's the big one. But he certainly is not afraid to hurt people. 
Actually, if I would say he is, um, I don't know if he's more driven or if it's just the same level of you know ferocity that we've always seen him on the mission. And I think it's you know, you're kind of, in a way, he is being pushed into you know going to a different level, going taking it up a notch. You know, you think about just the him, you know, his fighting the cops on the you know on the the top of the broadcasting at the Joker. He really didn't ha- have a choice but to throw down with them. He didn't kill any of them, but he did have to throw down to try because he was there to try to stop the Joker. And you get a cool sequence where he's fighting. He understands he's got to throw down and he's got to do it. But you also got Ellen doing her part saying, "Hey." You know what? I'm not going to back down just because it's the Batman. Open fire, you know, and pulls in the copter, blow away the gas, doing everything she can do to stop it. So I think seeing the intensity on all parties was something that it added to realism. And again, this is something that my first read through kind of annoyed me. I'm like, why are you fighting him about this? You know, he's right to the point where I'm not like saying, no, I understand what she's doing. I understand why she's doing it and understand why Bruce has to actually push it. Why Bruce has to be a little bit harder. He's got to be a little bit fiercer. He's got to actually get them to slow down, to back off. Maybe he can get some rookies to hold their fire. Maybe he can get some guys who aren't as, you know, elite uh, combat, you know, to, you know, think twice cuz he doesn't want to kill them, but he's got to protect himself. Did you was that the only one who's worried about Selena Kyle? <laughs> oh god, big time. Big time because especially, you know, we one where the Joker, the crazy nature of it, and when he first kisses her, I'm like, oh god, oh no. But when I read the line, you know, you should be grateful. I changed my lip- lipstick. Are you grateful? Yes, grateful. And I gotta admit, first time reading through, I didn't completely understand the whole mind control thing, where I didn't know exactly what was going on. I'm like, wait, what's you know? And then I had to stop and think about it and focus. I, oh, okay, that's what he meant by changing his. Um, you know, changing his lipstick. I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of neat. What do you think the Joker's motivation is? One, I think he's actually thinking, I think he's looking for his smile. He's looking for his laughter. He's looking to, you know, get the groove back going on. And it's whatever the Joker's motivation always was. I think it's still that same thing. It's that craziness, that, that homicidal, pure homicidal craziness that there is... No real explanation. There is no real way you can, you know, ever, um, you know, reform him. You can ever, he'll never be sane. This is, his brain just operates on a different level than any normal person. And I think it's, he's trying to get that groove. He's trying to get comfortable with being who he is and who he's about. It's, it's kind of interesting. The, you think about the Joker we have present day who cut off his face, how he was trying to get his group, how he was trying to get Bruce to back, to be back on the level that he always thought Bruce should be. I could see that person becoming this Joker. I, and it's a really a cool notion that, you know, I know it was never really the intention to do that, but I can really see that. I can see that guy turning into this type of person. I like when they're on that glider and Carrie almost falls to her death. And, and the reaction between the two, even the hug, you know, the embrace yeah. that's there, it shows how Bruce is, you know, with Jason's death. He distanced himself from this kind of thing. And now that he's embraced it again because of what he went through with Jason. He values her more. And that's an evolution of the character that I think is interesting here to see him in kind of that role. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, definitely. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting with, um, you know, even through those moments, you know, Carrie almost dies. Bruce saves her and he's like, good soldier, good soldier. And you see that tenderness. But then he does reach out to, you know, um, you know Ellen uh, and says, hey. This is Batman. Governor's life is in danger. I haven't the time to save him. It's up to you. And I love that moment that he still reaches out to her, knowing she is a person of honor, knowing she is a good cop, that she's not corrupt, that she's going to actually do something about this while he goes after the Joker. And I thought that was just a cool, cool moment of, you know, just that him knowing what who he is dealing with. And she has that panel, that, that one panel, that silent panel where she's staring at the mic saying, OK, what do I do here? Do I sit there and say, hey, forget you, I'm not your, you're not my boss, or do you do the right thing? And the fact that she shows up at the amusement park late does imply that she does the right thing, and she does go after the governor. And I was like, okay, that's cool. 
I do find sometimes when they use the relationship between Batman and the police, whether it's in the comics or in this case, you know, on film and in the comics, um, it's it's always interesting when you have characters at the forefront who have a philosophy that you clearly know, and yet you can kind you can justify their actions even though you don't agree with them. Like, I, do I want her in any way, shape, or form stopping Batman? No, I'm clearly rooting for Batman. Yet I get her, and I think that's fun. When your story explores that, it makes the char- that's what makes the character three dimensional. Because we all know you can have a hard time like dealing with that in other situations. Yeah, and it's um, you know, kind of interesting because you sit there and you think about just the you know, motivation and just everything that they're going through, and why would the police fight him? Why would they do that? And I always like that exploration and that understanding and that notions behind what Bruce is doing, why he's doing, what Clark's doing, why he's doing it, why he's kind of their, why he's, you know, the government's lapdog in a way. He sticks to the shadows because in a way he is protecting his friend. Now, this one page where he's holding Carrie, and can you see it, Joker? Feel it. It feels to me like it's written all over my face. I've lain awake at nights planning it, picturing it, endless nights. Conjuring every possible method, treasuring every imaginary moment. From the beginning, I knew that there's nothing wrong with you that I can't fix with my hands. Now, knowing what we know about Bruce, for him to be going into a situation with the Joker, where it's clear he's planning to end it with him, what is your feeling on that? Do you think, I mean, I know we've talked about this and debated, and and we're both in firm agreement that, yeah, the Joker death penalty is, you know... He's, he's fair game for that. What do you think about Batman approaching it that way? Again, with this uh, universe, with everything that I'm reading, I never had an issue with uh, this sequence. I never had an issue that the Batman's like, it ends tonight. This is it. Because it seemed like a very fitting and very appropriate time for him to do it. This is a lifetime of trying to rehabilitate him. It can't be done. And he just keeps adding the bodies, adding the bodies. Every single time... You know, you think about how many people have died since, you know, that very first encounter. Had Batman killed him at that time, all those people would be alive. Bruce knows that number, and it haunts him in his sleep. This is the time. It must end tonight. And I had, reading this every single time, I've never had an issue with that. And it's, now, if present-day Batman was thinking that, I probably would have an issue, because he didn't have such a long lifetime of, you know, of, just the experience and just the attempts at trying to, you know, put him away, lock him up, keep it so no one, you know, keep society safe from him. And this Bruce has seen way too much of that. He's like, it's done. This series has been really good at build. Like, I've really enjoyed the build to the various sequences. Uh, I loved Batman's use of the mirrors, especially in the film. You know, oh, you got to yeah. see him in different areas. But I thought um, both versions really did a great job of, of bringing to life a multi-layered battle. You know, the end battle was not one simple thing. The characters went through a lot to get oh, to God, that yeah. end point. Well, both of them. And I love the fact that Carrie had to go uh, solo to take out the bomb on the roller coaster. She had to take out Abner. She had to do that. And I thought that was a really cool, just, again, you know, Batman's got to trust his partner. He's got to know she can handle the job. And here you see her step up. You see her going and doing it. She's not completely, you know... You know, fluid and just perfect. She stumbles, she falls, she makes mistakes, but she never quits. She keeps going. She knows what's at stake. She knows the innocent lives are at stake, and she keeps pushing. And, you know, eventually she does get the save. She does save, you know, the people. She blasts the the bomb away. And I thought those were just really cool, just, you know, usage of her. But then the interaction between her and Batman, her and Batman in the fight, and just... You know, this was a you know one of those action sequences that on page looks wonderful, on screen looks wonderful. This was a win-win situation on both sides, and I have gotta say, when the opening salvo with the batarangs and he puts it right in Joker's eye, I thought that for me was like a holy crud moment. That was the first time I really realized he was going to kill him. Because even the lines leading up to it, it ends tonight with my own hands. I'm thinking, okay, he's going to put a beat down on him. You know, that first time that goes in his eye, I'm like, um, this ain't going to be a beat down. He's going to kill him. And I think that was a realization for me. I was like, wow, that's cool. You know, and then 
you know, as I grew older and I reread it, I was like, yeah, this, you could see it right here. Oh, this is neat. You know, and throughout this whole sequence, every time he's talking about Joker, you can see the setup, the you know, the planning, just the laying out the the you know, just this overall future picture of what we're gonna see. I was like, dang, that's cool. I liked the whole bit with Batman in the sequence with the kid. Yeah. <laughs> Watch your language, son. Yes, sir. The point counterpoints throughout this series, I think, has been really great with the reactions. Uh, even how they affect the Joker. Because people are so out of touch and so media driven. His commentary, Miller's commentary on this on the media and the way that we are, um, we are, dr- we are. I guess I'm using the word driven again, but I guess the media kind of is something we've learned to rely on instead of just getting straight news. It's very hard nowadays to get unbiased news, and, you know, where there isn't some form of opinion spin, some form of editorializing. And as a society, we've, I think, we tend to tune in more for the people that are being a little bit more outrageous one way or the other versus the straight facts. I don't know. I don't know if you agree with that, but I, th- I think he's making a commentary on that here, which was funny. Again, it's another area where I think he's been cutting edge. Oh God, yeah, uh, completely agree with you on that. And you know, it's you know, I always laugh at when you see these people dealing with the Joker because I know if this was real life, if I was in Gotham, you know, when Joker was running around, I'd be ducking for cover. I'd be getting behind something, you know, protective because, you know, he's about to do something crazy. And I think that was something that I loved in the animated movie that you're just seeing him running around just randomly just shooting people. And he's like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And you get panels of that in the, um, in the comic, but they really accentuated it in the uh, movie because they, they had more, room and more time they could do it they could show him shooting you know as he's running down an aisle they can bam 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 have him kill three quick people where in the comic you have a panel where you see three dead bodies i think it was just accentuated everything of just just the nature and the savagery that he is i like the use of the amusement park here you know it it really feels like a coming full circle for batman and the joker kind of going back to the scene of the crime so to speak of the many years of the torment battle between these two uh, I liked Bruce with battle damage in this. You know, where it was really a Bruce who... The situation between Bruce and the Joker could have easily gone one way or the other. I felt like the Joker knew him well enough to plan yeah. for him and how to deal with him, and we got to see some of that play out here. I liked that it was a lengthy battle in the book and, of course, on the big screen. It felt epic. I would have been really sorely disappointed had we not seen this kind of epic ending between the two. And the Joker, you know, really in his own way, ending himself. Because it really wasn't Batman that killed him. Right. You know, the Joker killed himself. And I think we kind of keep referring to that like, you know, Batman really did do the deed. Now, he hurt him pretty severely, but he would have lived if Batman had his druthers about it. Yeah, he, yeah. he paralyzed them from the neck down. And you think about just, you know, what happened to Barbara, how Barbara was in the chair from the waist down. So it was kind of an interesting factor that, you know, how, you know, this is the end of the Joker, that he's not going to kill him. He's still going to hold on to the code, but Joker won't let him. And that's the first time we see the maniacal laugh. We see the big, broad smile on the Joker when he kills himself. Up until this point, we always had a straight face Joker. We had, you know, more serious, and it wasn't the -the over-the-top laughter. This was the final joke. This was it, because he knew what the police would do. He knew what the media would do. They would think, oh, Batman killed me. Batman killed somebody. That's it. They're all, and they're going to come full on, you know, everything they got coming after Bats, and he didn't technically do it. And I think that that was the final joke, and I love the fact that how that played out. Would you laugh at the irony that the Killing Joke wasn't released yet with this? Really? Killing Joke was 88. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. So it's like all of these things work. And I agree with everything. When you, I was like nodding when you were, were tying it into the Killing Joke. And I, I went and looked. So I'm not like saying I knew this off the top of my head. I, I started thinking to myself, I'm like, because this for me, I read these things as they came out. But it's been so many years that I really don't remember what order they released in. And I started thinking to myself when you're saying, I'm like, it's, you know, Jim's right on the level that it works on. But I don't think Killing Joke was out yet with this. Because this was really the one that launched this, with the success of this, these prestige format Batman books. And, you know, more and more of them coming down the line. And this was, you know, whew, 
Um, the, the way that this book works on so many levels with tragic Batman stories, other ones, is just, I think, pretty mind-blowingly cool. He is called Hawkman. His gauntlets possess awesome powers. How's it going, Sean? How's it going, Jim? This is uh, Brandon Cullen again outside New Orleans. I uh, wanted to give a talk about this week with the uh, the Superman animated movie coming out, Unbound. I uh, just kind of got finished watching it. It was pretty good, pretty good. But I tell you what, more excited about the Flashpoint movie coming out, the extra on the Blu-ray I got, uh, giving a little quick flash to the Flashpoint uh, movie that they're working on. Man, I am excited about that one. So, so excited about that one. I cannot wait to see what they're going to do with this. And uh, the quick glimpse that they gave us of uh, Thomas Wayne Batman in there looked fantastic. Uh, I, I talked about Injustice a couple of weeks ago uh, with you guys. I actually, uh, as of today, I downloaded a ultimate skin for the Flashpoint Batman, which is awesome. Uh, you know, I love I love that DC starting to do this, and I hope, you know, I talked uh, recently about DC and other media. I hope they start to to do this cross-promotion stuff, which I think is what's going on with the Flashpoint skins and the Unjustice. You know, they're using that opportunity uh, to kind of advertise that before the movie comes out and get people familiar, you know, with this uh, this concept, the story that they're going to be releasing. Uh, I know a while back, ooh, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, back when I purchased the Green Lantern Emerald Knights, I think, I want to say, or maybe it was the Green Lantern Blu-ray. One of them, when I purchased it, came with a code to unlock the uh, Sinestro Core Batman in the Batman Arkham game, and it was a, you know, it was a cool skin. You got to play through the game as you know, Yellow Lantern Batman. So you know, that was that was really cool. And I, I hope they start doing some of that stuff. I actually was kind of thinking maybe I was going to get something in the uh, Superman Unbound that just released and Injustice released, you know, the week, uh, week or two before that. They, they missed the boat on that one, but they still, I, I think they're going the right direction with their advertisements. I think they're starting to realize that, you know, you can cross promote your stuff. They've always done that, but I like to see a little bit more care in how they handle it. And I think they've done that with, like I said, introducing the uh, Flashpoint skins and Injustice, considering that movie's coming out. Now, to go back to the original point of the call with the uh, Superman Unbound, man, I love these DC animated movies. I get pumped up every time they come up. Uh, I'm listening to the show right now, your anniversary show. Congratulations again, guys. But uh, on Batman Year One, and, you know, I was so excited that they brought that one out and, you know, did the Dark Knight Returns and did it in a great two-part fashion. Not to mention after that. I mean, it's it's fantastic. Uh, it's it's like Bruce Tim. We're gonna miss the guy, by the way. You know, I know. I'm pretty sure you mentioned on the show. You know him stepping down, which I wish him the best endeavors and everything he's done. Because God knows he has made my life so much happier for the last at least 15 years, uh, bringing us the DC animated shows on TV. You know, with Batman being his big baby, and then. Uh, you know, going on to Superman and Justice League and Unlimited and all of that stuff. And really, without those stories, we would never have gotten these animated movies, which in the beginning, you know, they were releasing like Superman Doomsday and uh, Batman Mask of the Phantasm had a lot more to do with the animated world, the uh, Justice League world. Uh, just like uh, I want to say it was Superman, Batman, Public Enemies was pretty much like a direct continuation, I think, of that world. Uh, they've done so much as to even bring some of the uh, voices in. Now, more recently, it looks like they're going to the comic, you know, they're tapping the comic book well, like you said, Batman Year One, Red Hood, uh, Superman the Elite was really, really cool. I, I, I'm having a hard time, actually. You know, we talk about how we would rate our comics and what we would drop and not drop if we had to make a choice, this, that, and the other. And it's hard to rate your 1 through 10s. And I'm actually sitting here looking at my Blu-ray shelf. And even with, like, let's see here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, there's 15, 16 altogether animated movies I have on my shelf. And I, I 
I almost would have a hard time rating them because I look at them and I'd go, my number one is, is Batman under the red hood. No, 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 wait, the dark Knight returns was really good. And that, that scene with Ollie and the green, the arrow and Superman, and that's awesome stuff. I really like Emerald Knights. That was a good story. It was kind of like a tale from the core, almost an anthology in a movie. I like that one as number. I can't do it. You know, it's, it's, it's a funny situation. I can't even rate my animated movies. That was the original uh, intent of this call was I was going to go and give you an order of how I love the movies, you know, one through five or whatever, you know, my top five. And I can't name my top five. I love them all equally so much. You know, they've done such different things with them too. You know, they had the, uh, the justice league ones. I particularly love, uh, crisis on two hours. I think was awesome. And, uh, Justice League of Doom, they did a great job and they had the voices of the characters we love from the TV show on there. So, you know, it's, it's hard to rate these things. They're so good. I'm glad they're doing these projects. Um, New Frontier and All-Star Batman, by the way. Whole league of their own. I think uh, New Frontier is one of the best adaptions I have ever seen from comic book to uh, physical translation. It was it, it, It's great. If anybody uh, out there hasn't checked that one out, I definitely recommend that one to check out. It's one of the best stories. Again, I couldn't rate it number one because I don't know which one I could rate number one. That's a good problem to have. Uh, and I hope they keep doing this stuff going forward. You know, with Bruce Tim stepping down, I I hope they, they, they continue. I know uh, it's kind of awesome that we're getting two of them back to back like this so quickly with uh, Unbound coming out and a month, two months later, we're going to get Flashpoint. Uh, I'd love to see at least two or three of these release a year because I always buy them right away. I get my Blu-ray with my little... Uh, action fit here to put on my shelf. Uh, it's funny listening to you guys talk about the pack-ins for all the, the comic books and stuff you guys used to get. Uh, that's my latest addiction is actually I just hunted down the three I didn't have on eBay. When they release at Best Buy, these Blu-rays, they come with a little uh, two-inch figure, I want to say, for the pack-in. And uh, since I figured that out, that's that's been my obsession. That's been my collectible. I have to go out and get the first week so I don't miss it. But uh, anyway, guys, uh, just calling to give you another little comment on something else DC Universe related. Uh, happy anniversary, guys. Keep up the good work. Great show. You know, I don't know if we mentioned on the show that he's leaving. Um, that's That always is something that worries me when you hear a change, especially when you're enjoying things like these direct-to-DVD releases. I think it's just we've all as fans of the comics and everything we want to see more of this content made available so when you see somebody who's bringing it together and doing it so well and, and there, obviously there's a team of people behind this but you know he's a name that you've been associated with at being at the helm of it so i'm glad to hear that it looks like people who've already been working in these franchises ha- are going to be continuing on and i just i'm excited for the future of them. the flashpoint trailer i agree with you looks stellar I hope that they just continue making a profit with these and they continue with the quality. As I'm with you, I'm having trouble choosing which one I like the best. It typically is the one that's the most recent. I, I don't know. I, I Basically, I'm just going to echo everything that you're saying. And thank you for the kind words about the show and our anniversary. And thank you for your support. Um, you've been a frequent caller and I really enjoy your commentary. So please continue to do so. And I, I open that up to anybody. I, I really think that this show is better served when you get community comments that are a part of it. And it's always great to hear what you guys are thinking. I enjoy the open dialogue. So uh, looking forward to another year with you guys uh, chatting more about comics. How's it going, Jim? Sean, this is Bernie calling again out of New Orleans. I've uh, got my uh, <laughs> comic talk now. Uh, actually just catching up with my shipment. Uh, had a couple of things I wanted to talk about. You know, a while back I called about the creative changes and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I always use times like these, like you guys say, to dabble and read new things. And, you know, I jumped off of action for a while with Grant Morrison. I loved what he was doing for a while, but it, it got out of my reach. So I let it go and uh, I decided to give the last couple of issues a, a try and I jumped on board. And, and <laughs> man, I, I hope whoever they get to take over the story uh, does as good a job as, as the last few issues, uh, 19 and 20. They were, they were incredible. And I got to say, Tony Daniel, his best job 
uh, I've seen so far in the new 52 on everything he's done. You know, he did a good job on detective art wise, but I just, uh, especially issue 19 of, of action, I thought was the most beautiful I've seen of a Superman comic in the new 52. It just, uh, the, the layouts, the spreads, all of it, the way he used this panel structuring, uh, it just looked incredible. Uh, the scope of it, the battles in the comic, it was, it was awesome. So, uh, I was just, I was really hyped about that one. So, you know, I hope they keep going forward with, uh, good stories like that. Cause I love the interpretation of it too. Lex Luthor finally, <laughs> he was, uh, he was pretty cool. I was waiting for some good Lex and, uh, catching up now. That was, that was pretty cool to see that in there. So this weird Kryptonian virus that came out of them, it was, it was, it was a weird story, but it was definitely cool. I enjoyed it. So, uh, I'm interested to see where they go from here and, uh, what new creators I get to jump on board with that one. Uh, one of my second points, uh, catching up actually on the last two titles of Justice League of America. And I've got to tell you, I so pumped about that series. You know, I was, I'm bummed about Jeff Johns leaving Green Lantern because it's one of my, one of my universes. I love his Green Lantern work and he's doing, he's doing great stuff over there. But I think I'm now excited. I'm more excited that he's leaving because uh, if this is the kind of stuff that we're going to get out of him, you know, he's, he seems to be in, reinvigorated with this work. It is awesome. He is doing great work with this team book. You know, I love his work on Justice League. It's been solid from the beginning. You know, good stories. Uh, nothing bad about it. But, you know, good, solid stories. Nothing spectacular either. But these, uh, I don't know, it seems like he's, he's something personal he's putting into it. I don't know. This characterization is awesome. Martian Manhunter and Catwoman, Hawkman. I don't, he's nailing these characters. I'm loving them, especially, you know, Vibe and Hawkman's interpretation when they're first meeting and the, you're full of blood. It's not my blood. That does a little screwed over thing. It's just, it's incredible. Catwoman. He's 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 nailing her. I mean, doing a great job of of of, of her characterization. Uh, you know, setting her up as the bad guy in the third issue. Uh, it's good stuff. You know, they're doing some interesting stories over there. They've got a whole bad secret society going on. Uh, Green Arrow, love his interpretation. Another one he's nailing with uh, Ali buying his way on the team basically you know blackmailing them in the end of that issue he's doing great work so i'm 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 really excited now to see what's gonna what he's gonna come up with you know now that he's he's left green lantern it seems to be he is invigorated again and we're gonna get some awesome stories so i'm really really excited to see you know uh where that one goes so uh Anyway, guys, uh, the, oh, yeah, and one last one, Batman and Fred Robbins <laughs> with Carrie Kelly. What, what, where did that come from? What a weird uh, <laughs> weird thing to throw in there, but very cool. I can't wait to see where, we, uh, where we're where we going to go with her. I don't know if there, it was just kind of a throwaway thing. I'm sure we're going to see her more down the line, but I don't know if we're going to see her right now or if that was something they planted through the future. There's all the speculation on who the next Robin would be. I, I really don't think they're going to go that way. I, I think there was just uh, a nod to throw Carrie Kelly in there. But uh, it's very cool, her knowing Damien. And, uh, wow, what a weird story with Bruce. He he was going nuts there, right? Taking apart uh, old Frank. Poor guy. Uh, <laughs> I've seen Bruce stressed out before. But, man, that issue was definitely Bruce at his max level of stress. He, he's going through some stuff and uh, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at, I've got the next issue right now, Batman and the Red Hood to uh, read. And I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I was bummed that Tomasi lost Damien. Still, still hurting to talk about it, but I'm kind of excited to see that uh, Tomasi is going to get to write different characters. Now I'm a little bummed that uh, we were supposed to get a, you know, more Tim Drake in that issue. And it, it it just seems like every time they put, you know, they talk about Tim in an issue, he's barely in the issue. I feel so bad. I, I want to see some more Red Robin. <laughs> We're not getting to see the guy too much. Uh, so that that's kind of a bummer. I hope we get to see him some more in the future. And it, Him and Batman had a, a real bad falling out there, it seems. So that'll be interesting to see where their relationship goes in the future at this point. But uh, anyway, guys, I'm excited to see where 
all of those uh, those stories are going forward. There's some good titles, and uh, I'm excited to see where they are. We want to hear what you guys think about them. I know uh, you're uh, Jim. You're a big Batman, no, not Batman, uh, Superman fan. What do you think about Action Comics and the direction it's going in? Are you excited? Well, just I want to hear your thoughts. Take it easy, guys. Let me actually start with that. Jim isn't here right now, but. I know we had a discussion on the show about the first issue of the Action Comics run, and I know from follow-up discussions we've had on the phone, Jim loves what's going on with Action Comics right now. It's a lot of what you're saying. It's You're torn when a creative team that you've been liking is already on a book, and then they leave, and then you get a new creative team on, you hope that they deliver the same kind of quality or a a you know, different sort of energy, an excitement that's maybe on the same level. You know what I'm talking about, where you hope that change just feels just as satisfying as a fan. So I'm with a lot of your comments on here about how sometimes you got to give a new creative team, a new creative cha- t- change a chance. Green Lantern's a great example of that, where I feel that this has ended so strong. And we're going to get an opportunity to see some new creators come on that I hope get the, have that same energy about them. I want to see that same excitement that we've been dealing with. But Justice League of America, for me, has been amazing. As a Hawkman fan, I've been wanting to see a Hawkman that I'm just super excited about. I felt like his solo title started to get that towards the end. And, you know, it was so, there was that great creative Mark Poulton. I, I know I keep referencing him with he when he and Ryle, Bob Liefeld were on it. We were getting some really good stuff. And then I've been just enjoying it right to the end. But then Jeff Johns has been taking over on Justice League of America with his character. And it seems like they finally have gotten Hawkman to the point where he's the character that I understand. And I'm really digging that. But beyond just Hawkman, if you take a look at the whole team, I'm with you. It's a very different, a very unusual lineup. And what's great about it is it's a lineup that feels like almost like the antithesis of the regular Justice League team. And I love the way that it was created that way. And that's what makes it feel fresh and different. And I'm enjoying the main Justice League book and this book equally as well. You're touching on some of the things I'm really digging about this book, though. I think this team is so intriguing on the way that it's put together that it's just a lot of fun to read about. So I'll have to have Jim next time we record, make some comments about action comics as well, because I know that he's digging that title and those changes. And you're right. This is a time when, when the creative team changes a chance to kind of dabble a bit and see what uh, creators are doing elsewhere, you know, throughout the line, throughout comics. I tend to follow creators uh, and I follow characters. I I tend to be a hybrid of both. It's always fun to see what creators are doing elsewhere when they do new things. And, you know, I mentioned on the last episode that I'm really excited about Gail Simone on Red Sonja. So, I mean, that's just something different for me. So, you know, that kind of stuff, that's what's fun about comics is it's always fun to kind of dabble all over the place and enjoy that. So thanks for the call, Brandon. Hey, Sean, Jim, it's Jack calling to let you guys know you guys have done a fantastic job on the uh, past 350 so episodes that you guys have done so far. I love your guys' work. I think you guys are uh, much better than an uh, iFanboy, and I also really enjoy your guys' discussions on the other works, like Valiant's Harbinger Wars and things like that. Hopefully, I'll be able to pick those up in trade and, and enjoy those. Thank you guys for all the hard work every week or so you guys do the podcast, and hopefully uh, I'll be seeing you guys uh, next weekend at the March City Comic Con. Thanks. Bye. Well, thanks for the kind words, Jack. It's actually one of the funny things on the show. I have been very lucky over the years that I've met a lot of the other podcasters out there. And I found that one of the things I really love about the podcasting community is we're all doing something a little bit different. And there's something for everybody. I think there's a lot of overlap between podcasts, especially nowadays. I think it's so much easier to download shows and be able to do your own mixes. I think some people listen to every show of every podcast. Some people listen to bits and pieces of them, Um, even segments. One of the reasons why I put show notes in there. I'm, I'm sure there's people listening right now that only listen to certain segments of the show. And that's okay. I really hope that, um, I think it's one of the cool things about podcasting as a medium is there's a lot of opportunity to custom customize your listening experience to your own tastes. So that's pretty awesome. And 
thank you very much about the Motor City Comic Con. I know you and I have been talking about that. I would love to hit that eventually. It's just the timing always seems to be a tough one for me, but that's a con that I look at because its guest lineup is always really cool. So hopefully this year I'll be able to see people at, I know I'm going to be at the, for sure, the Wizard World Ohio Con, because that's right in my neck of the woods. It's in Columbus, which is just a few hours, uh, a couple hours south of me. And uh, I don't know convention-wise other than that. You know, it's typically, as we all know, trying to find the budget, not just for our comics, but also for things like conventions to be able to hit them. And I would like to hit a couple more cons in the coming year. I just don't know what that looks like. I'll always post that stuff on the show website, and I will also, of course, announce it on the podcast itself, which is uh, the first place that I would announce it. So thanks a lot, Jack. How's it going, Sean? Jim, this is uh, Brandon calling out New Orleans. Uh, Calling this week to talk about a little Green Lantern, actually. Uh, as we all know, it was the, the week of the big exodus from the books. Uh, you know, and these, these being some of my, my favorite titles since the New 52 relaunch, uh, were hit pretty hard. Actually, you know, Green Lantern being one of my top tier titles since 10 years ago when Jeff Johns took over. Um, yeah, this one hit me hard, but man, I gotta say, I am so happy with this book. I'm so pleased with the way it turned out, the ending. Um, even with the price point of seven ninety nine, you know, I'm, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, I guess I'd say, but usually, uh, you know, when I buy the, the DC marquee big price books, uh, I, I tend to be a little let down and disappointed with some things, not all the time. Uh, but you know, especially like, uh, most recently detective 900, you know, there were good things in it, but I tend not to enjoy the whole thing. And if you're hitting me over the head with 9.99 to 8.99, 7.99, I want something you know truly worthwhile for that price point. I get that you're selling me uh, a, a little bit more for it, but I would I'd rather better. But anyway, to, to, let's get away from that because this 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 is like I said, worth the 7.99 price point right on the cover, Wrath of the First Land and the epic finale. And boy, oh boy, was it epic. I mean, just, you know, right off in the first couple of pages, you you get this awesome little uh, Green Lantern recruit in the future who uh, is getting it. He just gets inducted. You know, he passes all his stuff, and now he's officially a Green Lantern, and he goes off to to the chamber, and he wants wants to hear the story, the one story that, that every new recruit wants to hear, the story that everyone should know, but no one truly knows. It's it's so epic. I love the way they introduced it, the way they set it up. It was it was awesome. Uh, they, they recap, you know, Jeff's, Jeff's era, you know, starting off with Rebirth and, of course, uh, the story of Hal and Parallax, the possession of the fear entity. Um, then you get to see uh, Hal's Rebirth uh, from Parallax, and we go over all of the different color cores and everything that Hal has has done up to this point, including, you know, the beginning of the new 52 with him and Sinestro hooking up, becoming the buddy cop, which again, like I say, in the, in the beginning of the new 52, that man was my, my, my number one in Jet Green Lantern. I just, I loved the stories that they've been putting, that Jeff has been putting in this book consistently. And in the beginning, the buddy cop thing with Sinestro was awesome. The way, the, the places he's taken this book, before the new 52 and since the new 52 has been great. And I, I'm just, I will be so sad. <laughs> He's gone talking about it right now. But anyway, so we, we jumped to how dead, of course he, he jumped as of the last issue. And, and then we, we find out he, he gets the black ring. And I love the explanation for why he gets the black ring. You know, he gets asked, how did you get the black ring? And he says, I, I will, but you know, basically he, Hal's will was so strong, even in death, it overcame the Black Lantern ring, and it, it came from that's that that's an awesome concept, I think. But uh, then you get Volthoom, of course, uh, you know, messing with the Guardians, kind of telling them he's going to take uh, you know his ultimate plans about to happen. He's going to get what he's finally there for, and uh, then you see the reason that. Uh, Gansett has had his emotions all along. He's had the the first ring inside him, which was able to 
uh, keep his emotions. And then the, 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 the terrible look on all the Guardians' faces as they start to feel these things for the first time in billions of years that uh, the first line is showing them. It's, it's, it's just, it's awesome. Um, then, of course, you get the, sorry, I'm outside, <laughs> big helicopter passing over me. Um, then you, you get the big uh, the big charge with the Lantern Corps jumping in, you know, coming after them, constructs blazing. Um, kind of go over a couple of pages, you know, you get the, you get the big epic fight, which we all knew was coming, you know, it's kind of kind of Blackest Night thing. You get Atrocis jumping in there, and uh, Falsoom just making it's just making ever making it look like cake work. He's just taking care of these guys left and right. You know, Red Lanterns can spray blood uh, constructs or whatever you want to call it out of their mouth, the acid. Uh, he, he, he spits his own little flare out of his mouth. He's basically anything that they throw at him, he's matching construct for construct, uh, beam for beam, whatever you want to do. And they come up with this great plan to use Mogo. You know, all the Lanterns are there at this point. We, we've got... Uh, <laughs> Just an awesome spread page. You see them all right there. Kyle in White Lantern form, Atrocitus, Atrocitus, Baz, Kilowog, uh, and, and Mogo. And, of course, John Stewart with a, <laughs> a little construct uh, aiming reticle device over his eyes, making sure that they, Mo- Mogo hits his target. It's, it was an awesome little scene. But then we come to the, the best part, the Sinestro. Oh, my God. You know, if I was to say Batman were my favorite hero, Sinestro would be my favorite villain. I've always liked him as a kid. Uh, there was something about him I, I just I, I thought was was creepy yet not so over the top villainous. You know, he was he was more dictatorish, and Johns has definitely brought that out in his run. And he's he's brought out that you know Sinestro isn't completely evil. It's just it's his perception of, of, of things. That is what makes him evil. He will do what he needs to do to get the job done. That's how Sinestro has always been, uh, which I guess good for us in this matter, because as we, uh, as we know, we'll, we'll skip ahead a little bit, you know, Hal comes in with his black lanterns charging. Everybody's surprised. Oh my God, Hal's dead. Cal has a moment with Kyle. Kyle, can you bring, can you bring him back? I don't do that. Not my thing. I can heal him, but he's gone. I can't bring bring gone people back. But um, you know, you get this big epic fight. Carol's there, and Hal's charging into Volthoom, and Volthoom, of course, takes. He's been. We 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 know from the last couple of issues of all of the the Green Lantern titles that Volthoom has messed with everybody emotionally. And what is the one thing that Hal has always held on to emotionally? His father's death. And Volthoom finds a way to to take that and uh, exploit it. And it, it's just, it's awful. Uh, <laughs> the greatest part of the issue right here, I'm looking at it is uh, Sinestro. Like I said, he does what it, he does what has to be done to get the job done. He goes to his power battery and uh, pulls out Parallax, the creature, where it all started. You know, John's run started with how being possessed by the entity of Parallax. And that was the catalyst for all of the events that, that you know move forward from there and the different color cores. So how fitting is it that I always you can tell I guess in, in his writing that he does have a fondness for Sinestro, I, and you know I, I truly think he likes Hal as a character. He loves Hal and the Green Lantern Corps. But I, I I really over the years you can tell how much he adores Sinestro as a character, and uh, to see Sinestro take possession of parallax and not po- parallax take possession of him is awesome because that is how confident in uh just awesome Sinestro is um, you know i'm not gonna you've controlled before i'm not going to be controlled he basically tells him he goes after volthoom volthoom they declares he's a god there's nothing he can do about it uh big epic battle still ensues hal comes back with necron it's just so much to to talk about in this issue, but uh, then of course, Hal gets his Green Lantern ring back. That's one of the you know the the shining moments in this issue. The hoorah! The ring flies back to him, and as soon as he get gets the ring back on his finger, what does he say? Take a hike back to your tomb, Necron. 
He's been controlling Necron this entire fight. He sends him back. Uh, and it seems to be that, you know, the day is won. And uh, no surprise, what, what what would happen after all of this goes down, the big fight, it comes down to Hal and Sinestro. And how, how pretty much knows that Sinestro wants to see, you know, the end of the Guardians. And uh, Hal and Sinestro, you know, they have this, this conversation it is really heartfelt conversation. And, you know, that's where Sinestro tells him, you know, basically. Brandon, your conversation cut off here. So please, if there was more that you wanted to add, cause you were like right in the middle of a thought there, please make sure to call in. I'm going to hold off on my comments here because we're going to talk about this issue right after our dark Knight strikes again episode. So there is a plan to discuss the green lantern universe. And then obviously to discuss what's been going on in DC in general, while Jim and I have been doing this Frank Miller exploration. So there, there is a plan with all of this, so I'm so glad you shared your thoughts, and please feel free to expand if there was something that got cut up, because obviously you were mid-thought, so please feel free to call back and do that, and anybody who has thoughts about this, please feel free to call in, if anything, it'll only add to our discussion as we come up and do that episode, but there is a plan to, I don't know how we couldn't visit that issue on the show, we will be doing that in two episodes. We are Crystal Man from Mercury, we have no quarrel with you. Jim, as we jump into the fourth part of this, The Dark Knight Falls, actually the second recording of this two-parter for us, we're trying to get in an episode before I go away from my brother's 40th birthday, and I just want to shout it out because, um, you know, it's a big birthday for my brother Tom, so we're going to be uh, doing a nice celebration this weekend. But and where are you going for this celebration? We're going to Vegas. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. But I, it's great because I have an opportunity beforehand to have this discussion with you to kind of wrap this up. Because we're really left with this whole Joker scenario. You know, the Joker has just offed himself, leaving Batman, who's already in a very tentative position. You know, the police right now are very divided. You know, you've got the old school guard that still believe in the bat and things like that. But you've got this new commissioner now and a younger set who don't necessarily see things the way that the old, they don't know him. This is a guy who's been out of action for quite some time. And he's more of a legend now than a trusted ally. So it's an interesting environment. It's one of the things I've always enjoyed about this series, when you read it. There is a real sense of time passage between when he was Batman to him coming back. And it's there's that's one of the areas where I really have a fond memory for this series, was this feeling of... You, you, you know, I've talked about this since we've started the show. You have this love for this sense of progression. This is a story that I think embraces the idea of what would progression really look like for Batman. What what would happen if he retired? What would happen if, after so much time out of the Cape and Cowl, he was driven to don it again? The world around him became so intolerable that he had to once again become this symbol, this agent of change. How would he accomplish that when the, the numbers game, the age game, so much of the world is playing against him? It's hard not to rally behind what he's trying to do here. <laughs> oh God, yeah, yeah, and it's one of the things about this the, these sequences, you know, with uh, the, what we saw on paper, what we see on the screen. Mm -hmm. I think this was another one of those great sequences where I loved the physical action on the screen, and I loved how it played out, and you really got to see the sinister and just the, the viciousness of the Joker as he's running through arbitrarily just shooting people. Oh, boom, boom, oh, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, oh, you too. And just, you know, just going along and just, you know, without thought, without concern, just killing people. And But then you get the... You don't get to see as much of it in the page by page because of limited spacing, but you still get that same feel. You still get that same fire. And as we now get into the siege of the police on the Tunnel of Love, you get that same where on page, this is a great story. Physically, that was a great story. This was something that this this type, this uh, book was really uh, a great you know, just a great usage for the animated series, for the animated uh, movies. This was what I would say is just an, the ideal type of story that really comes over well. And you got to, you know, I enjoyed the movie. You know, prob you know I, I still will say I enjoyed the movie more than the book. But you got to give full nods and say, yes, this was a great story because this is the foundation. And 
I wasn't, I was never lost. I was never confused. You got that feeling of energy. You got that feeling of motion. You got that feeling just of the, the sheer drama of what Bruce is going through throughout this. And I was like, this is just a great usage of, you know, the storytelling uh, medium. And I was just like, wow. I like the idea that what the Joker did, it's kind of, Batman got into this battle with him. Batman beat him. And as as fans, we're rallying behind Batman, you know, with the win. The Joker pulled his final joke. Yep. You know, which is really to take Batman's one code that he's always maintained. It's that line that has always allowed him to operate in Gotham the way that he does. He doesn't kill. He went and offed himself in a way where the damage that Batman did looks like it's what killed him. I love it. I, it's it's really just, it's such a it, vintage Joker. Yeah. What I love about it here is that he didn't actually do it. Batman was driven that far, and yet he still, in the end, didn't do it. There was something about that that just for me I thought was really important. It, and that's one of the things that I think about Batman having the code. It's why I don't want... I don't want Batman to violate that ever. You know, there's something about that that's important to me because when you see this moment, it's more powerful because you know he wouldn't. Like if Batman went off and like, you you know, went on a killing spree or something like that, (laughs) this means nothing. (laughs) It really just means nothing. Yeah, Punisher Bat wouldn't, I think it would lose something. You know, and I like the Punisher and I like, you know. I do too. I like the, the heroes that do kill the villains. I think those are some great stories, but... Part of just the the might and just the the mystique of Batman is that he doesn't kill, and I, I do I am glad they did they didn't cross that line they didn't have him snap Joker's neck, but you see him not really you know, he's not uh, torn up over it, especially when you spit on the dead body. That's you know, but the, and again very appropriate, very fitting. I like that you know the fact that he would do that, the, the fact that he's like just. This is it. Now, well, Joe- wait, hang on. I'm, I'm, please go back to what you're going to say in one second. I, what I like about it, too, because I just want to build off what you're saying here. Symbolically, the Joker had, has already spit on him. <laughs> uh, yeah, big time. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It, well, now, with when the Joker's body bursts into flames, mm-hmm. Bruce didn't booby trap the, the body. Joker booby trapped himself, correct? Yes. Okay. That's how I read it, and that's what I thought. But the police are thinking... Bruce booby trapped the body, and once again, another nice little you know um, another thing to add to um, just the way the police are going to look at Bruce. They're going to look at him, and say, not only did he kill this guy, then he booby trapped the body for us. You know, and every action that Bruce is taking here, where he's carefully planning, he is planning not to kill the cops. He's not trying to kill them. They got the body armor. He can, you know, they can take the they can take the blows. They can take the explosion. But in their mind, right now, every single cop in that um, tunnel and in the surrounding area is thinking Batman's trying to kill us. So this will even add to just the fire going against Bruce. And I think that. Is again, it's another really cool moment, another cool uh, Joker. Whether Joker completely hundred percent planned that, or Joker just knew this would all just start snowballing out of uh, control for him. See, I guess I'm of the mind. It's funny how sometimes you're older, and I don't think it's anything to do with age. I think I've my distance from this story. I haven't read it in a while until we, I started rereading it again for the show, and of course watching the movie when it came out. I look at it as. I think this was the Joker's plan all along. I think he knew that after what happened, you know, with Batman and and being brought back and and his mental state and all that, he knew that the buttons could be pushed. Batman wouldn't kill him, but he knew Batman would want to hurt him. And he knew if he set himself up in the perfect... I think Joker totally planned that from the start. Uh, I think this is very much the kind of Joker that we saw in the most recent Death of the Family storyline where he's manipulating events into making it look like the way he wants it to look because it's a good joke. You know, it's it's a twisted joke. It's his mm-hmm. last laugh. And, you know, in Death of the Family, you're left with these resonating scars from what he did that even though you don't really know for sure what the Joker knew and what he didn't, he put just enough doubt in your mind. You're looking at this storyline right now, even those closest to Batman that have... Um, on the police force end that have seen him in action. There's just enough here to make them doubt. And that's all that's important because now you're breaking this, this sense of camaraderie that he had with the police force that ultimately the Joker was looking at would be a way to weaken what Batman's done, you know, and, and that in of himself is, is enough to make the Joker laugh. 
Yeah, and I, I completely agree with you. This was the plan from day one. This was well, not day one. This was the plan from once he started coming back around. Once the old Joker came back, this is what he was going for. This was his end game. And it's funny because you think about back to issue one, where Bruce is looking for the perfect way to die. He's looking for that that worthy death. To Joker, right here, this was a worthy death. Uh-huh. This is you know he not only got you know completely set. At, set Bruce up for everything, he gets his final laugh. He gets that one last you know, joke on everybody. And I think that's just a very appropriate, very just true to the, to the Joker. It was wonderful. Yeah, and that's some, this is to me how the Joker should be written. Uh, you know, there's certain stories we talk about characters like Lex Luthor, for example. I know you're a huge fan of, of the character of Lex Luthor. When he's written in a way that you really understand how mentally... And with, you know, science and with, you know, his power and money, he can really become a very formidable threat, even with his deep psychological issues when it comes to Superman. The Joker has that same thing about him. When you write him like this, you actually understand why this man, who is the agent of chaos, he's the perfect foil for Batman, who's trying to bring order, constant control and order back to the city. A city that's just chock full of what the, you know, it's for the Joker, it's almost home. You know, this is his, Gotham's his ultimate playground because there's so much of the tentative nature of Gotham that can be tipped in the favor of chaos. I love this. Um, oh, there's yeah. a there's a deep psychological side to what goes on with Batman that I think is just plain cool. Yeah, and it's neat because a lot of this stuff... They don't lay it flat out for you and tell you you need to think this, think this way. But they give you so many enough clues and enough guide on the story that you can pull this from that. And I'll tell you, that is something that I know when I first read this a long time ago, I wasn't reading that deep into the story. I was doing a surface read, really. It wasn't you know going in depth to it. Wasn't thinking about it. Wasn't talking to people about it. I think part of you know my my early my original you know just you know feelings towards this book were because of that because i didn't stop to think i didn't reread stuff i didn't do that in-depth reading and start looking at stuff and i it's something that you know i've learned to do through the podcast through through the you know the show that you know just you take your time with the story read it once read it a second to read go through a third time maybe you know like with me i do my read and then i do my art read and then i do another read through and just you take your time with it and you enjoy and you savor what you have in front of you and this is one of those stories that you really need to start looking at the different levels of it. Look at the different, uh, you know, just where it's going and not just take it for, uh, you know, surface value. I love the sense of through dialogue bubbles and, you know, just broken speech <laughs> that you really see the amount of damage that's been done to Batman, but also that the man almost starts becoming, I don't want to say delirious and delusional because it's clear that the man's still there, but this, you know, stop, stop laughing when he's looking at the Joker. And just, to me, one of the great things about Batman, I love the strategist Batman. I love when you see that part where Batman knows more than you do. But I also love that when you see him in these moments, the determination of the drive, when you remember that he's human, the fact that this guy keeps going, even when he is at the point where somebody else would pack it in. He can't. He's not done yet. And he keeps going. And it's funny how, like, this the guy in the beginning of this story was trying to blow himself up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now he's tr- fighting to live. Just a very, it, it shows that how re-embracing the whole of himself, which is something Harvey Dent couldn't do earlier on in the story. Mm-hmm. Bruce being able to, like, really start rediscovering who he really is, the part that he f- kind of forced himself because it was the quote-unquote right thing to do, the part that he f- kind of cut out of himself... Uh, is and I think it's something when you when you do retire from something, if you don't find something else to fill that side, fill you know to be as satisfying as what you were doing before, you run into that danger. And there, there's an interesting message here. You know, he never he never found that something to fill the hole. Yeah, well, he never will be able to fill that hole. And I think that's part of you know who Bruce is. There's that. He'll always have that pit of darkness in him. He'll always have that demon. And it's part of, you know, his his greatest strength, but also his greatest weakness. 
he you know it's that darkness is was born the day his parents died were born out of that you know the uh, the pledge he made the that darkness keeps feeding the energy keeps him going keeps pushing him along but it also will prevent him from ever just settling down you know relaxing and just having a you know a normal life it it does beg the question that is it ever possible for Bruce to have a quote unquote normal life like let's say hypothetically he saves gotham let's say that ever was something that could happen because you know i mean we've dealt with multiple timelines right with bruce is it possible for him ever to have a normal what is a normal life right but right (laughs) but is it possible for a guy like him to be satisfied with a normal life okay can we go to the let's go to the dark knight rises right okay in the end we see that sequence where he's with selena right right and that that's not I know people probably this might be a dream or something like that. No, he repaired the autopilot. He's alive. <laughs> <laughs> He's with Selena there, though. Are you, at any level, are the two of them going to have a normal life? <laughs> no. And Bruce can't have a normal life. No. I, I can't see him just sitting back, relaxing. I could see him doing it maybe for a year. Maybe yeah. he'd make it 12 months. I don't think she'll make it 12 months. I think the she'll miss the thrill of the of the hunt she'll miss the thrill of the steel she'll just miss that life that she was and then as she starts you know sneaking off in the middle of the night to steal something or maybe break in and not actually physically take the item but just actually break in just to break in you know do that i took the thing then put it back and leave you know he'll have those same type of moments where he'll be slipping out in the middle of the night beating up a mugger and coming back and it just this is part of his being this is you know part of who he is and i don't think he could walk away from it that was the whole the when he was you know his retirement period that he had where he always he he wasn't living he was in the uh, the manor he was mourning rachel he was you know just not living a life anymore and i think you know his embracing of life him returning to the cowl then quote unquote retiring i don't think he'll ever stop being the man in the cowl even if he's not actually wearing it it's you know i i can't see him just relaxing and you know having a family and kids and whatnot yeah uh, that's something that's important to me to see with the character i've always liked the idea of him having kids like with damien and with the yeah. huntress and all that stuff uh, i but I like the idea that that leads to that a legacy. They they have to look up to their dad and know that he was Batman, and yeah. that becomes a part of their world. That's not normal. <laughs> no, no. That's why I say when I say you not have kids, I mean not have like kids like you or I would have. No, 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 no. no. I, I'm not. Normal. I'm building on what you're saying, yeah. not disputing what you're saying. So okay, please, cool. please don't take me wrong here. Um, I think you're bringing up an interesting idea, and, and I'm a lot of what you're saying resonates with. My, I grew up with the multiverse uh, version of Batman being in, in play too, where he had a daughter, he married Catwoman. You know those those things happen. You know we're seeing a lot of that brought back in in Earth Two. You know as a concept as well. I've always liked that idea that even even in yeah. that case, you know he doesn't re- he doesn't just step aside, uh, and and there's a legacy that's developed there of this need to continue on what was created as Batman. And I think even if he saved Gotham, there would be another place, another something that he would, another cause that he would get involved in. The action, the the pivotal event that happened in his childhood with his parents made him mad, not just at the killer of his parents, it made him mad at injustice in general in the world. He would find a way to be involved in that. My favorite Bruce Wayne stories are the ones where you see him in Bruce Wayne mode, finding a way to use Wayne Enterprises as a, a form of change. Uh, yeah. I, I'm a no man's land. There were cool elements in that story where he had to be Bruce Wayne for long stretches in order to, because Batman couldn't do what Bruce Wayne could. And I'm going to stay general with that because if you haven't read No Man's Land, I, I could highly recommend kind of seeing that. I like the duality of that, where yeah. you know he does recognize that there's an importance to that side of him, and and, and that kind of says to me, even if he, at whatever reason, had to drop the cape and cowl, we see that. Well, actually, we did Nightfall, Night's Quest, Night's End. You know, we talked we talked casually about that. We saw what he was doing as Bruce Wayne <laughs> when he couldn't be Batman, I, and that to me, you know, is a guy. No matter what happens to him, he's always going to be pulled back into being Batman, or he's going to be incredibly unsatisfied, as we see in the beginning of this, with who he is. I love this story so much because Miller really understands Batman and what makes him tick. Oh, definitely. And it's 
not it's funny because you can't just understand Batman. You got to understand Bruce in and out of the cowl because there are the characterizations, there is the personality of on both sides. Now we really get a heavy focus of him in the cowl. We don't really see the Bruce Wayne million dollar playboy or billion dollar playboy or any of that in these stories, but you still get those moments in the cave. You still get those moments with Alfred. You get those moments where he's in accepting and embracing his age. And I love just a lot of like this throughout the sequence in the, you know, the tunnel when he's getting out he, multiple times, he says, he's lucky, lucky old man, doddering, helpless, lucky, you know, and it's, he keeps repeating that. And it's something that Bruce never would have accepted before. It was all about preparation, the prepared this, it's about the mission. No, he, Bruce is recognizing, Hey, there's, you know, there is some weakness here. I'm not, you know, the kid I was, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, the young, you know, the young buck that I always, you know, used to be. And I like seeing that his acceptance of his mortality, the acceptance of his limitations, but he doesn't let it stop him. He always pushes through. He keeps going. It's improvise, adapt, overcome, bob and weave. Yeah. And that's something that is really important to me with the character. It's, I think in life, in this situation right here where you see it with him, you're seeing a situation with this character where his back is up against the wall. He keeps going on and on. He pulls out a gun in that moment, not because he wants to hurt anybody. Um, It's really about, I need any form of edge I can get to escape. Everything's about escape, not about hurting people, killing people, anything like that. It's escaping, damaging vehicles, causing explosions, things like that. It's it's all uh, smoke and mirrors and distraction to get a slight edge, a few split seconds to allow him to escape. Robin, in that moment, I I absolutely adored her in this sequence. You got this kid who you've noted many times on this. She doesn't have the experience. Bruce has been training her on the job, so to speak, and I feel that we've seen her grow in this story, but still the amount of time passage in this is not great. But yet we're seeing one of the things I like about Carrie Kelly, and I know I keep referring to her in a connection with Tim Drake. I don't. It's funny. This time through, I connect her more with Tim Drake than I ever have. And she predates him. One of the reasons why I think that way is you're seeing her use street smarts, book smarts. You know, this is a smart kid on every level in the way that she's operating. And that's something that I always found engaging about her. She doesn't let her mentor, even when she's scared, you know, she's, look at that, property damage, auto. She's taking control and doing things that he told her he would fire her for. (laughs) But she's doing it because it's the smart thing to do. It's the right thing to do. She's learning from him, but she's also bringing her own skill set into it. She doesn't give up. She doesn't surrender either. She's a great Robin. Mm-hmm. I really like what she does here. Like the the pulling him away and getting him to escape. Wow. Okay, yeah. I knew she'd make it. I might have at her age. <laughs> <laughs> How neat was that? I know. And, and that sequence, there were some really cool little, there were some cool art moments that I didn't catch initially. And I'm, you know, reread throughs. You know, when Bruce first explodes through the wall, you see the helicopter in a distance, but there is that little yellow color splash hanging at the bottom there. And I never noticed the, her cape right there. And then as, you know, he, as she's uh, throwing the rope around him, you can see where she tied it off onto the leg of the helicopter. And then even the look of uh, kind of pain on Bruce's face as he's getting snap whipped um, out of there. That would hurt like heck, especially if you've got uh, been gut stabbed, shot and blown up like uh, Bruce had just been. I love just those little details and those little moments. I was like, oh, that's that's cool. And that's really, that's part of this story that I've really remembered. In the 80s when I was reading this, I remember going to the comic shop and just every moment was cool. You know, and that's something, I'm, I'm glad you're getting that because um, I'm kind of living vicariously through you because <laughs> I feel like you're connecting with this story in a way that you never did. Oh, God, yeah. And, and it's different, and I actually appreciate that. Like, I'm enjoying getting your viewpoint on this story and seeing where you and I have differences and variations as far as how we viewed it and what our preferences are between the, um, the animated version and the book version. But seeing this through your eyes and seeing you kind of connect with it in a different way because you're coming at it from a different perspective <laughs> has just been a lot of fun for me because it's a deep, deep story. I love the idea of these mutants kind of choosing sides now, being motivated to choose to either be you know, with Batman, against Batman, 
And it, with the majority of them really kind of looking for this new leadership guidance that they had before with the mutant leader, who they realize, like, you know, don't really, ha- I can't have faith in him anymore. He's been broken down. Um, it, it just, it leads to me to this, I, Batman is an enigma. And I could see him, this is a lot of what's going on with Batman Inc., him inspiring others to follow his example as agents of change. And it's so great to see like Frank Miller doing this back then, Grant Morrison taking it to a new level in a new direction when he was doing it. There's things that happen in the Batman universe that I think become cyclical. They come back around, new creators, new fresh ideas. They take these things and and just pump them in a, a new direction that just makes you further understand what the original creator was trying to do back in the day. And I, this story just has such a tremendous influence, I think, to so much that came after it, that it, it's just great to have the opportunity to really acknowledge some of these brilliant moments. There's one moment I want to make sure I don't ignore. The you look tired, Kent moment, Bruce, yeah. it's over. You know, that that moment with Superman, it was really important to me. Oh, God, yeah. It's just the laying out. And this was, you know, it, it was a couple just small panels that could very easily get overlooked. But one of the things I kind of liked was the fact that you see, you know, this, that you look tired. Well, you've earned a good night's sleep. Heck of a police action, if you ask me. I didn't. You know, just that, you know, something that, you know, Clark wouldn't normally be, you know, you always think about Clark as being the polite farm boy. Right there, that wasn't the polite farm boy. That was a, hey, just be quiet right now. And you can probably even imagine there was a little tone and, you know, just a little sound in his voice, maybe in a little annoyance with the guy and just, you know what, just stop it right now. And he knows what's going to happen. He knows where this is going to go. He knows what's going to happen now. And he's just getting mentally ready for the battle. That's something that to me is the great buildup of this. I, you know, it's funny how my memories of this story my fond memories of the story, I'm going to be honest, tend to stem from the early issues where we see Bruce coming back. Because that re-embracing of being Batman has always been my like high-five moments. When he and Robin finally get it together, you know, I, I noted as we've been doing this, the, the sequences where, like, wow, that splash was cool, or that spread. And it's not because it was a splash page. Those were usually where we finally got those moments of, like, the cool moment where he and Carrie are, you know, swinging together in that moment. And you get to see him finally when he's Batman again for the first time. We finally see him in that big page as Batman, embracing it again. Those are moments that stood out for me. I loved the Batman-Superman fight, but it, was, it wasn't the part that stood out for me the most in this story, which might seem strange to people listening to this. This time through, I really loved it, because I really loved the build. Mm-hmm. You know, this whole idea of him having to recover from everything he went through, but this being exactly what you're talking about, I mean, it's just so amazing. Oh, God, yeah. And, again... The just the patchwork medical stuff that's going on, and I, I say patchwork meaning that it's not, you know, to standard. It's not to code, but it is still it's it's a you know, military triage type of style where you know you know he's going to be all right. He'll live. There's a big difference between being all right and living. You know, he, you know, Alfred's you know talented and he is knowledgeable, but. This is just barely holding Bruce together. And I love the fact that there is this constant battle damage. There is this constant recovery. And if this was the young Bruce, he would have recovered a lot quicker and a lot sooner and be a lot better. But this isn't. This is an older man. This is somebody who shouldn't be doing this stuff. And I like seeing this, the, the fact that it does weigh in on him. And it's, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, you sit back and you're like, oh, man. It stinks getting old. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, I, I do enjoy seeing the progression. I do enjoy seeing this out of Bruce. It's, it's kind of weird. I'm, I feel bad for my friend, but I'm enjoying the story that I'm getting. I'm enjoying his suffering. I like the sense of age, not just in Bruce, but also in Clark. You know, when we talk about time passage, we see that time has changed Clark, had an effect on Clark. And we see a man very torn between between his new sense of duty and trying to hold things together in this world. And I feel with this story, I really need to think of it as the Dark Knight Returns world. You know, yeah. the Millerverse. Uh, I tend to enjoy these stories a lot more when I think of it that way and kind of separate his own thing. It's a possible potential future, but it is not necessarily the destined one. This sequence where we see Superman like realize that the missiles are coming, recognizing that... 
in this moment, we're seeing Superman go up against something that can even hurt him, not kill him, but hurt him. This ends to, this goes to a big moment that Bruce, I think, philosophically fights with Clark on. Clark believes like he can sit there passively, at least that's my impression of it, and be part of like a government unit and somehow try to fit in with all that and not force there to be change. You know, he's trying to keep the peace, so to speak. Yeah. Whereas Bruce, on the other hand, is saying, you can't (laughs) try to keep their peace. You have to force them, if that makes sense. Yeah, oh, definitely. You know, and and, and I mean, not even so much in the sense that, like, you know, go in and take over the government. He doesn't mean it that way. It's more of a you have to show them the better way. You have to force the better way uh, by being that symbol. This whole thing that he does with the mutant gang has done that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say the same kind of thing where you're going with that. It's, you know, you look at just the the original classic versions of these two heroes. You know, the reason Clark never wore a mask is because he wanted to inspire hope and he wanted to be that beacon. And a person with a mask, always there's always a little bit of mistrust. So he made Clark Kent wear the mask and Superman was out there open, bright colors, boom, boom, da 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 And Bruce always stuck to the shadows. He used the mystery. He used the, you know, the fear, you know, to, for his uh, cause. Now they're shifting. You know, Bruce is out there. He, Bruce has to be make his fights public in front of the mutants. He's got to let people see him. He's got to inst- and that's how he inspires hope. While Clark is shifting back to the shadows, Clark is going. Okay, if everybody sees we're still around, if everybody sees all this power, they're gonna get afraid. They're gonna come after all of us. I've got to do what I do, but I've got to stay hidden. Mm-hmm. And I love just seeing that progression, that change of these two characters. Who everyone always says, you know, they're yeah, it's it's the the big debate of are they the same people? Are they opposite? What kind of characterizations? Because they both have that same no kill code. They both have that fight for the common, you know, fight for right, fight for truth, justice, and the American way. They both are fighting for that, but they always operated different operandums. One was in the light, one was in the dark. But you know, in in their core, they have those same goals and those same objectives. And it's neat to see that they kind of still have those same goals but they're handling the opposite directions again so it's kind of cool seeing just this progression and seeing how it changes through it yeah now one thing that i was um really fascinated throughout all of these things are these sons of batman and i list absolutely as the story progresses on you see what happens if you leave groups like this unchecked you know especially this last group with the nixons where you know they blow away the nixons okay yeah Okay, they're killing bad guys. Yeah, okay, not that. But then they go up to the shop clerk. Hey, you should have resisted. We're going to cut off your fingers. What? <laughs> Wait, hold on. This guy was robbed at gunpoint and you're cutting off his fingers? Come on. Um, that's not a good move. But it's, again, that whole what would happen if these guys do go unchecked, if these guys are left to their own devices, you know, where is this going to play out? Yeah. That is, that is something that I really liked about this, the build. I, it would have it disappointed me greatly. It, and I don't remember. It's funny how, like, this time through, I spent a lot more time enjoying the build up to the fight, to the battle between the two of them. That it wasn't just, bam, they have this philosophical difference and they're fighting. I guess my memories of this story, and I've read it many times, so it's not like I have these, like, you know, vague recollections of the story but for some reason this is the part of the story where i guess i i rushed i don't want to say rushed through but it always for me kind of goes to you jump from him to killing the joker to him and superman fighting i didn't pay as much attention to the build before now i really like the way that this plays out that there is this kind of tension of what's going on on the earth um there are these two guys that i think are both trying to do good things but just feel that there's very different ways to go about it. Um, I, I don't fault Clark for being more passive in the way that he's doing it. You know, Clark's Clark's a public figure, right in the public eye. You know, he's the guy that can talk to government leaders and world leaders and have deep-rooted conversations that maybe can affect things. And Clark's got to play the political game the second that you're in that. And I get that. I get the limitations of that. Bruce has his own limitations with the way he operates. He can't walk into a police station and say, hey, (laughs) I'm making a citizen's arrest. (laughs) Because in this world right now with how it is, 
you know, they don't trust heroes. And certainly, you know, the media doesn't trust them as well. And it's, yeah, it's, it's always fascinating when you start just thinking about this kind of stuff and you start looking at where it's going. And one of the things about the sequence with this nuke that I really enjoyed was the overlapping of the physical action with the interviewing, with the tech talk, with just Gordon on the street and just everything how it played out. I thought that was kind of a, some cool moments, again, of just the usage of the multiple panel layout where you have Clark turning the missile. And, oh, it's going to land harmlessly. No, it's not harmless. The, the EM pulse and then, you know, lose everything. You're like, oh, this is not good. And, you know, everybody on the street's not thinking this. I don't know if Clark was not thinking this or didn't realize what the bomb was or what was going to happen. But everybody was like, what? And then Bruce, as soon as he wakes up, he puts two and two together. He's like, oh, no, Clark, you idiot. You let them do it. I always knew you would. And I thought that was just some really, again, great build-up moments where you get this, you know, what should be a, um, you know, a holy crud moment. You're getting that holy crud moment. That Those holy crud moments, I think, are just one of the great. Uh, speak, you know, moment, this is going to seem like crazy. You know what was my, one of my favorite moments from this sequence? That's another one of my holy crud moments. It's strange. Seeing Batman on the horse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, yeah. There's something about that. You know, the power's gone out. And Batman doesn't give up. The horse becomes his new Batmobile. There's something iconic about that. I've always liked the swashbuckler Batman, too. You know, with Ra's al Ghul, when you see him with the swords, and two of them are sword fighting. This harkens to that Batman for me. When you see him on the horse, kind of taking that role. I dig that stuff a great deal. Oh, big time. And, again, these were some cool moments for... And, and I completely agree with you on this, that moment of him on the horse. But also, just, I like seeing the crowd reaction. And this was something that the, I think the movie did an absolute wonderful job with showing just how much chaos and how much disorder was happening on the streets. And the panels on the on the page are really cool, and you get that feeling, you get that sense of it, but there is something about just physically seeing it in front of you, hearing the screams, hearing the reaction, the the explosions, the fires, and just everybody how crazy, you know, the 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 majestic and the the beauty that is chaos you get to physically see that and that was something i really enjoyed on the movie and you got to give full props and credit to the original work here that it did a great job of showing this it showed the chaos by doing these multiple panels jumping around here boom 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 we got the you know mutants taking over the prison we got this we got this plane slowly crashing one panel then another panel then boom fire on the screen and i'm like man that you know there's some great moments of this i like the paint on the mutants faces when you see the bat symbol on there yeah um there's something like here's the problem that i have with the mutants that are following him and i think bruce knows this deep down if if there isn't that symbol there that's him they're gonna latch onto something else yeah these guys could easily be age, sons of the Joker, sons of Two Face, sons of you know anybody, sons of Black Mask. Anarchy, yeah, anarchy, exactly. These things all happen. All they need is the the enigma, the leader to do that. Bruce realizes that, but he also realizes he can use this as a way to bring control and order back to Gotham when it's not there, especially in a situation where now he already embraced being Batman again because of his hatred of where things were heading. Now, all of a sudden, he's being put into a situation where Gotham is like people are robbing, people are stealing. Well, this is one of those par- moments where we're having a parallel story going on with Jim Gordon. Yeah. Where Jim Gordon's facing this, too. And you see why these two guys were friends for so long. They have such a similar philosophy. You know, Jim Gordon like has a moment where he's retired. He's done. But yet he can't stand seeing all of his hard work spit on and he's got to take that moment where he's still jim gordon he's still the commissioner and he starts getting involved in stopping people from letting fires break out you know putting together a crew of people that basically saying hey you guys can loot you can stoop to this level um we can let our city fall i thought i'm going to be honest with you i thought the the uh, video version of this this sequence in particular with jim gordon i thought it was really great to see that come to life you know, when the little kid's struggling yeah. to give lift the pail and hands it to Gordon, 
that there's something in that moment that kid becomes a centerpiece. That inspiration, like how do you be a bystander watching that and not like go, oh, that kid's doing it. I kind of got to, right? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And I got to agree with you completely. I love that sequence in the movie. That yeah. was something that, you know, I have to give, you know, I got to give more props on the movie for that, you know, just how they played out, how they showed Gordon rallying the troops, rallying one part of Gotham where he was getting them to work together, getting them to start working together to fight the fire. Then the fire department shows up you know, on foot because they don't have cars, but guess what? They still got to do their job. And I love seeing just the, the common people rally, the common, the good people step up saying, no, we got a job to do. This is what we do. Let's, you know, let's knock this out. And I thought those were some really cool sequences. And then overlaying on with what Bruce was doing with the mutants, you know, and rallying them, well, the sons of Batman, and then eventually the mutants. These were some just those really powerful, powerful moments that, you know, again, artwork wise, you get the shadowy image of the bat riding, you know, with the, the sons of bat riding next to him. You get the mutants bursting through it. These are some cool panels and some great uh, visual stuff on on you know on the screen and this was this was a story that is just you know it was laid out wonderfully for this but it's it's tough because you, you know when i sit there and i try and i naturally when i compare two things i always say which one's better and there are times when you know i gotta give credit to the movie just because the physical action the voices just the 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 sounds the there's just the majesty behind it there's some really just cool human you know hum- humanic you know humanity moments that you really like seeing and even just the everyday people forming the line you know the nurses who are showing up helping people the mutants who eventually say hey, you know what we're going to take back we're going to help take back the city we're going to help fight for the city and just the 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 con- everyone coming together that was just some really wonderful moments for me yeah that's uh- that's something about this series that I think has been great. I want to comment again, though. You know, we're talking about the actual book. It's funny how, like, I love big splash pages and all that, and, and I love that kind of storytelling. But there's something about the small panels in this, and I don't know if it works for you the same way, where they're they're getting a lot of story in on each page. You figure this is an oversized book, so you've got yeah. the space to spread out. Technically, you could spread out a little bit. They don't. They take full advantage of every single area that they possibly can to fill in a very dense story on what's going on here. There's this moment where, like, Superman's, like, body is going through this horrid stuff that we get to see him going through, where he's fighting to reach the sun, and that leads him to crashing to the earth and grabbing onto sunflowers. I mean, there's something about seeing that in small panels. I think it's why the animated feature works so well. It's because, you know, I've mentioned it before, you're storyboarded like something on such an insane level that really can, it, it, it is, there's emotion to everything that's going on here. It's such a great marriage of visual and dialogue-led storytelling that just lends itself to being a film or an anime. I always wanted to see this as a film. Yeah. You know, see it, li- you know, see it live action and all that. Um, the animated feature, I, I think, was just mind-blowingly cool. Because it captured this perfectly. Oh, definitely. And it's, the, I do enjoy these small panels. I enjoy this, how they're laying everything out. And you're covering a lot of ground. And I think one of the things that I'm enjoying on the rereading is because I'm reading these uh, digital now. And I do enjoy this digital because I'm able to zoom in a little bit tighter. I'm able to increase the size of you know, what I'm actually looking at, where it's kind of, I think it's helping me appreciate the artwork, helping me appreciate the story being told just because I'm, it's just easier on my eyes, if nothing else. But it's, you know, this is a really cool format and just everything. There's so much they got to cover in this. You know, part of me, when I, I remember when I first read this, part of me wished they had done this, you know, Done multiple, um, done more, a couple more issues where they could have made these panels bigger. They could have, you know, done something different. Done five or six uh, books of this. I, you know, I don't know, but you know, it just it, that was something that kind of, you know, again, that was something that kind of turned me off a little bit on it. But now I can appreciate what they're doing and how they did it and why they did it this way because there's you got to show just the dy- dynamic uh, nature of what the changes happened. 
Like when you have this priest and the, the one kid with the loud boom box. And as all the chaos is going on, as you know, you know, people are beating each other up and riots are happening, who ends up helping this priest but this kid? You know, who ends up being there with him throughout the night as he's recovering? This kid. And I, I love just seeing everything pan out. And eventually, as you get to the final realization, that kid that was annoying, that was, you know, just that mouthy kid, ends up being the good guy in this whole thing. And it was, it was a, you know, just you needed all of that lead into it. You needed that whole thing to play out. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I think that's, that there's a certain play out in all this that I think is really important. I. I want to comment again, though. It's really important, these sequences where you see the priest with the patch on his eye. You see actual real citizens of Gotham, and even that same guy. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, I was shouting. (laughs) You know know what? When I was a kid, I wanted to smack him right now. Um, Reaching the page and just lay a a smack down on him. Right. Oh, yeah, big time. Um, That's one of those things that uh, just totally works for me. And it, the other cool thing is you have him, you know, justifying what he did, but you have that other guy who's also right in with the mix with him where you can see on that last panel, you know, he was like, I was strangling somebody. I, you know, and you can say, I still can't believe it, it got as bad as it did. You never know. Just a few minutes earlier, we, we'd have, and, you know, you could see just the way it's laid out that he's like, oh, God. Why was I doing it? Now, our sniveling, or you know, our you know, our, our scummy guy, he he has no issue with what he did. It was about survival to him. The other guy actually feels regret, feels remorse, and he knows things would have gotten even worse. And then we get that beautiful full page spread. You see Bruce, Robin, the sons of Batman, the mutants, all riding in to reclaim the city, to reclaim the order. I was just like, oh, that's cool. That's a cool moment. This. This sequence, Jim, this violent sequence where he's riding in with his gang, I love seeing the look on his face. Yeah. The defiance. It's a defiance to me. It's a defiance on the chaos that's come into his city. That's Batman to me. Batman is, no matter how dark things get in Gotham, he believes it's possible to change that. You know, that's something that I'm just engaged by. You know that that is something that uh, it just it totally blows my mind when you see that moment. I've seen it in so many stories, and it still gets me chills. You know where Batman, no matter how dark it gets, he finds a way to come back and be defiant. Even in stories like you take a look at R.I.P. Overwhelming odds are against him. It looks like he's been mentally just destroyed, and somewhere in there he's got a plan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Even if in his Batman of Zurin R or whatever he's doing over there. Um, you know, I mean, that's just crazy cool stuff. Yeah, and I love that moment where where he kind of sags in the saddle. Yes. And it's, you know, Robin's the one she notices it. And it was a, just a cool, just a couple panels there where she's like, it, it only once in the whole night that it shows. He's giving orders, you know. And all the mutants and the SOBs are everywhere, are gone for a minute. He just sags in the saddle like an old man. Then he straightens up and grins at me like it's funny. He can't die. I, just, I loved those couple panels there. That was, again, it was, you know, he's got to have those moments where you know, it's going to hit him. It's going to affect him. Well, yes, but he still needs to push on. He still needs to be Batman. He still needs to be this pillar of strength. And I thought those were some just some cool moments that he has that lapse, that moment of weakness, that moment of humanity. Yeah, yeah. That's something I like about him in this, too. The moments of humanity. Like when Alfred, even early on, like when he's on that table. Remember when Alfred pulled the thing out of the washing machine? Yeah. And he's like, it's still wet, sir. You know, because his, his back's hurting him and things like that. And we see him trying to climb the rope. You know, we're used to this guy, like, you know, spinning up rope super fast. He's not able to do that. That's something I really liked in this, that even though he feels younger again and he's reinvigorated mentally and emotionally, he's it. there is a physical limitation to him that's really apparent here. And I like that he doesn't ignore it. Like, he finds ways to compensate instead. You know, using gadgets and gizmos and wrapping himself up in all kinds of, you know, metal bionic enhancements, whatever you want to call them, the exoskeleton kind of things. I like that kind of stuff. 
Oh, damn. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, again, it's improvise, adapt, overcome, never, you know, never say die. However, whatever phraseology you want to use for it, Bruce has to always figure it out and find a way to push through. And it's pushing through the pain. It's pushing through just what he shouldn't have to what he shouldn't be able to do. He's able to do it. And it's, you know, it, those are those cool Bruce moments where you're like, you know, in the back of your head, you know, OK, no amount of money, no amount of training could ever get me to the level that he's at just because there's something in him that isn't normal. There's something in him that, you know, it's that demon inside him that won't let him quit. It, you know, most normal people do not have that. Most people don't have that drive and that determination. It's, you know, those are the, the cool moments. Yeah, and cool is one of the things that I always thought about this series. It, this led to so many cool Gotham by Gaslight. It led to Killing Joke. It led to, you know, the whole Elseworlds dynamic, the cult. Uh, so many stories spun out of this in the prestige format, and it was an era of cool. And, and you know, they were so, you know, obviously it was mainly as with today. You know, it's funny how people say today, oh, it's too many Batman books, too many Bat books. That's something that's not new to comics. You know, when you've got a character that people are excited about. You know, I grew up reading where, you know, like all of a sudden Batman's in Brave and the Bull. Batman's in Justice League. Batman's <laughs> in yeah. Batman families in Detective Comics. He's in Batman. You know, there's multiple Batman books. He's in World's Finest. You know, there's th this isn't something that just happened yesterday, you know, and it's not a today in comics thing. And, and honestly, when you love a character... You want more of them. You want to see more of that character. You want to see it well written. I don't want to just see that character. So I agree with everyone who's like, you know, I like the diversity and I, I, I'm with you. I like that stuff too. But yeah. this story in particular is just like one of those that, you're right, it brings on the cool. Do you, In this story, do you have a, it's a kind of a weird thing to, to ask. I really enjoyed in this story, and I think it because it was so foreign to me, the, the black bat symbol that kind of covers the whole chest. It was something, I know we talked about the yellow shield, but when he donned that because his costume got damaged, and we see him, there's something about the older Batman dressed like this that I really like. Do you have a preference with that, or is that just a me thing? I think that's just a you thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, um... I don't think I have a preference really on uh, either or. Mm -hmm. I do think the, uh, the the bright yellow with the bat, the black inside, it looks cooler. So I always will if if I have to choose between one or the well, other. Then I then always wait, go hold with on. That one. Then it's not a me thing. Yeah, but it, <laughs> but here's the thing: it's not like I don't sit there and look at it and you know and say, oh, that that looks that would look better if it was this way. I don't. Look at it that way. I do have a, a preference because I think, you know, just aesthetically, I think the one looks cooler than the other. But I don't I don't really have a preference, if that if that comment makes sense. <laughs> I have a preference, but I don't really have a preference. It's like I, I aesthetically you know, think one looks better than the other, but I don't really think about it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, I love, had, if you I had love, never I asked love, that, I love if, working with you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> if you had not asked that question, uh -huh. you know, odds are that that thought wouldn't have entered my head. Well, dude, like, do you think like I sit around all day long and like I, I like I'll walk around work and I'll go to somebody? So, yellow and black, or you know, black. <laughs> I, it's, it's one of those. It's coming up right now because we're seeing it here. <laughs> <laughs> So you do have a preference with it, you dolt. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I like your logic on it. I mean, that's for you. It, there's kind of a visual thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I kind of I, I had a feeling from previous comments you had on this that you did have that preference, which I think is interesting. Um, and I do harken it back to like my my experience growing up. I think was seeing that symbol so much that way that I think this one when it hit in the comic, it was new to me. It was fresh. It was something different. And there was something, I got to admit, it was something darker about it, which, uh, this was an era that kicked off a whole bunch of darkness. <laughs> and and it, I, at the time, it was edgy and new. It wasn't, you know, you, you throw this out on the show all the time. Is it edgy just to be edgy? At this time, there was a lot of edgy things being done just to push the envelope and really make people rethink comics. And the kind of stories that could be told, even with your big time heroes like these guys, you know, to say, you think, you know, Batman, let me tell you about Batman. 
And there was something, I think that symbol for me just, and it, maybe it, it's me hearkening back to that time. And you're right, I do think about it more. I guess I, I will pull back a little bit and say there's a certain element of a point because I'm, of how I'm going on this tirade about that to what you're saying. So I'm going to validate you a little bit here and go, you know, Jim's kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think there's an energy to this era that that symbol in that format reminds me of. So that may be where I am thinking of it on a level that you're not. <laughs> and, See, yeah, and, I, and I'm the dolt for the argument. <laughs> yes. But that's part of what we do. <laughs> you know, when the president pulls Clark, pulls Clark in and says, you know, basically, it's time to go. Yeah. It's time to do this. I, there's a couple things that I don't want to say I didn't notice it, but it didn't really ring true. Mm. And the the one thing about the president being really pretty much messed up, you know, and then you, they show the TV image of him where he doesn't look. He looks normal, looks like he normally would. But when he's talking to Clark, he's going in that uh, automated roller and he's kind of and his people are all in types of suits and body armor and whatnot. And I'm like, I didn't really catch on for some reason, seeing just how messed up the president was. I think that's a kind of a cool statement that they're putting out this front. They're putting out this image that, hey, everything's fine. Nothing we can't handle, folks. We're still America, and I'm still the president. Well, yeah, you're still, this is still America, and you're still the president, but you're really messed up over this. You took some major damage on this yourself. And I think that's kind of a neat, the fact that, again, it's more of that political commentary. It's more of that social commentary where it's not letting, you know, not not letting everybody see everything at once. The Oliver Queen, Bruce Wayne moments were some of my favorite, you know, seeing because Ollie to me is still that defiant kind of brash uh, Ollie. You know, there's something about there's a bitterness to him, but there's also a um, like kind of a liberal edge to him that I've always liked as well. Um, you also feel like this guy is about causes and uh, and yet. There's also that tragic part of Ollie that Ollie's doomed to always have the way that he handles a situation be one of those where he's going to put his foot in his mouth, he's going to, you know, and then have to deal with that. You know, and in this case, he put his arm in his mouth. <laughs> you, wanna go. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, Ollie yeah. just seems to. I love Ollie, he's a hero. I like that I agree with Ali 80% of the time, but there's that 20% where I'm like, oh, you're just really, not, you're, you're not doing that, right? Yeah. Um, and that would be sometimes a moral choice he makes, um, usually involving what, you know, where he should be, you know, faithful to Black Canary. Yeah. Um, you know, those type of things. But also when he gets involved in certain situations where maybe he should like take a page out of Bruce's book and stand back and regroup. But that's one of the nice things I like about these two. I loved Longbow Hunters. And one of the cool things about Longbow Hunters is a story when Mike Grell was doing that. And that was this spun out of this era as well. One of the cool things about stories like Longbow Hunters was it brought a little darker edge to Ollie and, you know, brought back the whole Archer thing. But it still kept in these this kind of thing with Ollie as well that he's known for. That you get him from like hard traveling heroes and stuff like that with the guy, that you know trouble kind of follows him. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and and that's that something about this. I just think the writing of him was fantastic in this. Yeah, you see, it's again another one where you feel this is the same guy coming forward, and I love the the Carrie's comments about you know who was that spud talks like my dad because we saw earlier mm -hmm. that you know her dad and her mom were the activists and the hey man yeah you know and you kind of can see the activist side of Ollie you can kind of see that you know the man is out to do this this is a government conspiracy you know you can see just that styling I always picture with Ollie and it was a really cool comparison where Ollie is a little bit more disciplined Ollie is a little bit more focused than her parents but they still have that same, you know, the hippie style of, you know, you can't trust the government. There's always the, you know, the hidden agendas. And you know that that 
Ali's probably had those statements, made those uh, comments, gone on those rants where his friends are like, okay, Ali, just relax, man, just relax. You know, he, he's had people had to placate him, had to just calm down, take a couple deep breaths, man. And it's, but it, it, it fits who he is. It works, you know, it's been like his history. And I think that's a, again, it's a cool moment that we see the older, we see their progression of him. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you that pro- progression has been something that, I've come to appreciate more and more. It's why I've always liked the, the multiverse. The multiverse was a way of dealing with a sense of progression. You took what was one universe, and you were saying, hey, we want to make characters that are younger. We want to kind of, you know, they went to a Silver Age era, so to speak. Well, instead of throwing away the Golden Age, they had it go on in another world. You know, they did the whole Flash of Two Worlds storyline, and DC opened that whole concept up. I was so glad they didn't take that as a throwaway story. You know, people started to embrace that concept. It took time, but wow, was that neat. That that sense of... And that's one of the reasons why I think with the New 52, there was so much of it met with resistance early on. is because people who've been reading progression for years want that continued sense of progression and continuity. Yeah, and it's... It's funny because I'm the guy who always said he wanted that, and he, you know, I'm getting it right here. And mm-hmm. this is, you know, it. I remember us having discussions and comments, and you know, and earlier debates in the beginning of the show where I was like, "Yeah, it'd be kind of neat." And you keep you kept throwing out there like, "Well, we get these stories, we get this stuff," and for some reason, I always wanted it like in the story. I did. I wanted it in there, and. I'm getting what you said all those years ago. I'm getting and understanding what you meant by the progression in the Elseworld, progression in stories like this, you know, where we don't need to see Bruce in an old Bruce in the current continuity. We can keep doing what we're doing. And I think it's, it's an understanding and appreciation of what is else is out there within this universe and by universe i mean the overall story arcing over these characters not the direct new dcu line or what was the dcu line the pre-flashpoint universe the we have these outside stories that gives you the what ifs and gives you the here's a future here's a possible future hey here's a neat story and it's accepting and appreciating the story you're being given, not saying, yes, it must connect to the continuity this way, and this is going to happen if this and this and that. You know, It's the kind of just letting go, relaxing, enjoy the story. This is something for your entertainment. And, and I think as time has progressed on the show, I'm starting to get that. I'm starting to understand that more, and I'm starting to appreciate more just – the alternate stories, you know, the alternate ways of looking at the life, looking at the universe. And I'm kind of some of my more OCC, you know, compass, you know, you know, obsessive compulsive stuff that just I got to I lock on and I can't let go. I'm starting to relax and let it go and just enjoy what I'm getting. And I think, you know, it's something it's a progression of just experience and reading and just, you know, life. See, I'm a fan of the idea that storytelling should be driven by creators and that you shouldn't pigeonhole or limit the ability to tell certain kinds of stories. I look at Dark Knight Returns as a great example of that. This is not something you can really do in the monthly book this way. This is the way to do it. Prestige format it. Do a deep, well-told story. I think the format that a story is released whether it's in current continuity or in a limited series or whatever, should be driven completely by the creative nature of the story. And that this is a great example of why that works. When you talked about progression, I love that idea. I'd love to see more progression. I'd love to see more opportunities to tell stories like that. I, I think you can still do that when you've got a universe running. Well, we do do that when you got the universe going. If you take a look at how... They handled the reboots, so to speak, of the soft reboots of Batman and Green Lantern and stuff like that. Uh, there's still the sense of progression in those titles. They, they took out some of the elements of what we considered a progression. But there is a history that's there that we've all valued. It's been altered slightly. And I liked, I actually really like the Flashpoint concept of altering it. I'm glad that that's going to become an animated feature. Yeah. Because I liked a great deal what... Flashpoint's tie-up did, because it didn't throw out the window everything that I read before. That is still a divergent timeline that it, you know existed, it happened, that this whole Pandora thing you know plays into all that. 
that is something that really, for me, is a critical reason why I think I was okay with all of this. But when Multiversity comes out, Grant Morrison's Multiversity, I hope it opens up more storytelling opportunities like this that could technically be a part of the larger universe because it happened on another world. And I, I kind of like that stuff. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Multiversity. It's, I th- again, some neat storytelling you know, from a creator I enjoy. So I'm like, oh, okay, let's rock and roll. And- where? The whole <laughs> where thing. And, and this reoccurring theme of the heartbeat popping up again and again, it, it's funny how this time through, I didn't realize how early. That is something that has not stopped in this since he originally had that, you know, with the fight with the Joker where he came out all hurt. The heartbeat has become a reoccurring premise in all this. And I, I, I really liked that build up to the reveal of what Batman's actually going to do here. Well, well, the heartbeat even was back in um, when he fought the mutant leader. It's the heart, the the, the concept of the heartbeat, the doo doo, you know, just that you know yeah, has yeah, been going yeah. on since I think the first issue. It's something they keep going through and they keep bringing back, and it's, you know, I think that was something I noticed, you know, on multiple read throughs is how far back that really goes. And really, this I, I think it was a great way to to make the fans think that Batman could actually die. Oh God, yeah. You know, and, you know, it's, I'm one of those, you know, on one hand, you're like, you know, really, can they do it? But, you know, when you read now, I was at the, um, I knew exactly how the story ended before reading it. So I, there was never any point in time when I thought he was going to die. I knew going into it. But if you're brand new to this, if you weren't, if like when you first read this, you were reading it as it was coming out. There weren't spoilers. I could actually see how someone would think, you know what? This could kill, uh, Bruce could die. This could be the death of Batman. And I thought that was a great way of handling it and a great way how everything played out, you know, where it's, What's going to happen? Where is, you know, is Bruce going to live? Is he going to die? It's the same thing when we got from um, the uh, the movie series, you know, just the ending of that where you're like, did, you know, did Batman die? Did he not die? Wait, oh, my God, they killed off Bruce. Oh, my God. Wait, they didn't. Oh, wow. I love just that whole the mystery, the surprise, the swerve at the end. You're like, yeah. But also the ability for him to become a symbol. <coughs> like, it's funny how much this to me, influenced the the path of Batman Begins, you know, the Dark Knight, and the Dark Knight Rises. Like, that ending that yeah. happened with Alfred and Bruce and all that stuff, really, I think, in some ways, echoes what happened here. You know, where you've got Blake going to the Batcave, and looking like, you know, he's going to start up the whole thing again, and, and just keep that symbol running. Um, that ending is a lot like what happened here, where you're teased with he gave himself to send a message, to make a point. He does that here with Superman with this fight. This fight is totally about waking up Superman, sending a message to Superman. I beat you. My, and it, it, it isn't a, just about a physical beating. It's about a philosophical beating. I stood in the face of this, you know, this being held down by the thumb of the government because I believe this is what's important. And no threat from you or anybody else is going to keep me from trying to make the world a better place the way that I feel I need to do it. And it really is the meeting of two strong ideologies. And it's funny how like watching this as in more in a more as a more mature well, as mature as I get, I guess, person and seeing Superman, I think in a little bit of a different light in this, meaning that I'm not against Superman the way that I was. When I, when I first read this, I was such a Batman guy. I'm like, beat him down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's being, you know, the guy who loved the Superman movies. I grew up loving Superman as a character. So I, I'm not an anti-Superman guy by any stretch. Uh, Supes is, you know, yay uh, in my book. But seeing this, this man... And recognizing that the... Did you, your first time through, focus on the damage that was done to Superman because of the nuke? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that was, that was something that I really enjoyed in this, was that there was this sense of Superman has been diminished on some level. That's why 
a lot of times the criticism that I hear people say when they talk about this story is, there's no way Batman could beat Superman. If you read the story on that surface level and that's all you see, then, like, I could see you arriving at that conclusion. But if you read and you take a look at what happened to Superman, when Superman became a toothpick in this, you know, I mean, Superman became a toothpick. Yeah, he has not fully recovered from that. Right. And that was something that... You know, from day one of the read through that, I loved how much roots had to go into to, you know, be able to stand toe to toe with Clark. Mm -hmm. And even when he stands toe to toe, he still gets it handed to him. He still gets his butt handed to him. And I thought that was something I enjoyed more in the book than the movie. Now, the movie had those cool, you know, really neat moments with the that super exo armor where he's lifting up stuff and he had the rockets. And there was a really cool dynamic fight sequence going on that you kind of needed in a story. And, you, you know, I completely understand why they did it. And I enjoyed watching it. But if I sit back and I look at it, I do like how the, the, how the battle played out on uh, paper. Because, it again, it has that realism. Clark just got blown up by a nuke. He really hasn't seen the light from the sun because everything's been blanketed in this nuclear winter. He is weakened. And when he first gets hit with a couple, you know, the surface-to-air missiles, guess what? You know, six missiles. If he was at his prime, he could have avoided them easily. Uh Uh-uh. They're smacking him around. He's taking a beating. He's nowhere near a hundred percent. There's no way he's going to be able to make it through. I think that was a really cool introductory moment where Bruce is going multiple levels. It's not just him standing, punching, going toe to toe. He's hitting him from multiple sides, dumping massive amount of damage on him. And Bruce is already, you know, Clark's already hurt going into this fight. You needed all these pieces together for Clark, for Bruce to have a shot at um, taking him. And it felt real and it felt true to form. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I, I that was a great thing about this story. I love the ending moment. Like, see, when I first read this, I did not know that Bruce was going to survive it. I really thought the point of this story was to show the ending of Batman. You know, figuring that it was so many years in the future that we were finally seeing, like, okay, this is how Batman would die. Yeah, that was something for me that really I. I found breathtaking at the time because you mentioned the lack of spoilers. There weren't ways in 86 to be getting, unless, you know, somebody that was a friend of yours had read the story and they tell you, you aren't getting spoilers about this. Yeah. What did you think about Alfred's death? That's the one that really depressed me. Mm -hmm. I was very, that when I said that I always saw the story was as depressing, it wasn't mostly how things played out with Bruce it was the death of Alfred that really got me. I would have rather seen Alfred survive this and walk away. Yeah. You know, and not have Alfred die. And that that was something because you see throughout all this, this, this older Alfred who's like, the man's earned his rest. You know, this is a guy of anybody, you know, Bruce has the demon in him keeping him going. Alfred's only there out of his loyalty and his pledge to the family. And the guy deserves a break. He deserves to breathe. He deserves to be retired, living in some old folks' home in England, just relaxing, kicking up his heels, having someone serve him tea. And in the end, what's his final, you know, thank you for everything? Oh, yeah, you die from a stroke. Yeah, okay, there you go. Good luck. And that was something that always affected me and always, it, it did in a way taint you know, my feelings towards this. And even as everything played out in the end there, it just, it, it always had that kind of a negative feel to it. But the movie had more of a positive. And they still had Alfred dying, which I was like, oh, man, did they have to do that? Couldn't they fake Alfred's death, too? But, you know, you do get kind of an upbeat uh, feeling to it at the end there just because you see Bruce is okay. It's now time for stage two of the plan. You know, I did everything there. It's time to continue on, but this time we're going to play it smarter. This time we're going to stick more to the shadows, and we're going to build up the army, and we're going to get ready for uh, what's to come. And I loved just how that you know the, that came through. Now, that wink that we see, <laughs> I absolutely love that moment. That was the moment that totally redeemed Superman for me. When I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know what? In his soul, at his core... Clark is such a good guy. And when you see that moment, he knows his friend's still alive and realizes what they've just been through. It was like in that moment, the two of them, Bruce learned from Clark Mm -hmm. because Bruce operates differently. In that moment, the two of them, it's almost like these two beat 
each other up to find a compromise. And and it's funny how I view this so differently now. In the end, they found a way, like Bruce made Clark respect. You know, but in the end, he also, Bruce had to realize there's a certain reality to the situation with Clark. And I, I really loved seeing that this time through. There was something super cool in that moment about realizing that, you know, Bruce is saying we're going to, you know, be hiding out and being more careful and training and planning and sticking and moving and, you know, these things that we're doing. And, and that book ending of this will be a good life, good enough. I will say that I'm very much with you that I would have loved to seen Alfred there. And even not if Alfred wasn't there, just knowing Alfred's alive. Yeah. That, that just – that always just hurt, you know, because this is a guy who's been nothing but loyal. He's been nothing but a true, a true guardian and his – his retirement is death. Bruce gets the cave. He gets, you know, the training, the sons of Batman. He gets Carrie. Everything's going great for him. Alfred gets a painful death. Like, that's just not fair to the guy. Except the one thing I do say with the dialogue is this. A jolt travels the length of Alfred's spine. Of course he thinks, as his head goes light, how utterly proper. For some reason, it's like when that chapter's closed and Wayne Manners burns down. It's kind of like it's a closure for him. And it depends on how I read, what mood I'm in when I read that dialogue, how I feel about it. But there's times where I'm like, this is a man who's contented that he's lived a full life and accomplished so much. When I read it that way. Yeah. You can see it. And I, a lot of the loneliness and the stuff you're going for here, I'm not disputing that because I get, I've gotten that. I've been depressed by the Alfred thing too. So I totally get it and I agree with you. So it's not, this is not a knocking you. But there's times when I read it now that I see the the positive of it too this contented man who's done so much like even when bruce dons all this again you got to figure he's like really we're going here again but yet he's loyal and does it because he feels like you know this is his chance to continue keeping this man alive and hopefully on some level reaching him you know because i i do think i liked in the the nolan verse films this idea that alfred was always trying to save him you know to, to help making this kid whole again yeah. That's why the ending of, to me, the ending of Dark Knight Rises was so cool because you got a similar moment to what you got here at the end where you see Bruce with Carrie. You know, there's thematically a lot of what was going on here was going on in those films. And I just really, I like that this story that was so important to me continues to be one where I read it differently as I get older. You know, there's just different things that I notice, different things I fixate on, different themes that become important to me with this guy in this story. And I love that, like, this ending sequence with Superman now is something that is a lot more powerful to me than it was back when I originally read it. Oh, God, yeah. And it's funny because just from the beginning of when we first started talking about this to present, from the first time I read it for the show, mm-hmm. you know, I, it, you know, just my feelings and just opinions on the story has just has gone through such a dramatic change that, you know, it's, you know, I I have to say I enjoy it much so much more now, partially because of well, not even partially, mostly because of our discussion, because you had I had to sit back and actually study it and think about it and just go in different places with us that, you know, by the end of the journey, by the end of our discussion, I'm sitting there going, you know, this was, you know, I had the respect for the story. I had respect for where everything, what, everything that came out of this and where this, you know, the, the, the nature of the story. But by the end, I'm like, you know, I have an equal enjoyment as, as well as respect for it. So this is, this is one of those stories that as the time has gone on, as we've done our thing, I've actually grown to enjoy this story more. And it's like, this is a really great story. This is, you know, something impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's funny how through our discussions, I've seen the story from the viewpoint of somebody who didn't read it as it was coming out. Like, I haven't had that experience with this where I've been able, I've obviously I've seen a lot of commentary from people over the years on the internet and through articles and things like that because this is a story. This tends to be one of those Batman stories that just is talked about. But it's a lot different having a one on one dialogue with this with somebody who really came at this from a different time than I did, who I grew up with during that time. You're like, when this was coming out, I knew you when this was coming out. <laughs> you know, and it's, it, we were at very different places and a very different path. Um, you and I didn't really. 
we knew each other through a mutual friend, you know, when this story was coming out, but we really hadn't connected as friends at this time. So we were in very different places. And it's funny, years later, from where we were back in 86, that, you know, who would have thunk that we would have been having this conversation? I know. (laughs) From such an an interesting standpoint. At at this point in time in life, you were that weird Narge fella. And and at this point in time, I'm I'm still that, I'm the the weird (laughs) Dr. Narge fella. (laughs) Things haven't changed that much. (laughs) I'm glad we had an opportunity to do this story, because uh, for just places in my life that there's stories that hold an important memory, being able to look back at where I was at as a human being when I read this story and how this was one of those stories that just kind of, you know, you're that awkward high school kid kind of trying to find his place, you know, where do you fit in and stuff like that. And you got a story like this that's coming out where you've got a guy who's trying to find his place again back in the world. It really was something that resonated with me, and it's why I have such a fondness for it to this day. Because it got me through a lot of that awkward era of my life. You know, which those high school years, as you well know, you know, that's when you've got, you know, that trying to figure out who you are and how you fit in places. And sometimes there's just things that happen. And this was one of those stories for me that did that. So it's, it's kind of cool to be able to revisit it and, and to enjoy it from this level. So I hope everyone listened and enjoyed this. Our next story is going to be Dark Knight Strikes Again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole different animal because that's from 2001. So uh, we're going to have to really have a, a big talk about that one. Green Lantern, let you and I destroy that space junk. Once again, sponsoring this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, remember to pick up the Batman Black and White Statues by Greg Capolo. He has a Batman one and a Joker one, and it's regularly $79.95, 32% off, only $54.37 for each of those statues. So depending on your preferences, it's a great opportunity to pick those up. Over at InStockTrades.com, don't forget to check out the new Teen Titans Omnibus, $75 regularly, 50% off, only $37.49. I want to thank DCB service.com and instocktrades.com for continuing to support our show. I want to shout out Facebook, Twitter, Google+. If you go to our show website and click on the About Us section, you can find ways to link to all those. I want to particularly shout out our Facebook group. What a great community of people there. If you're looking for a place to chat and hang, that's the way to do it. I want to shout out RagingBullets.com, our show website. And you know, please consider checking it out weekly because I, tr- I post anything that we're doing with the show. It's a great way to keep up to date. And that links right to Twitter. Twitter and Facebook and all those things too. So I just want to thank the great community we have that retweets us and shouts us out on Facebook and things like that. We don't have an advertising budget. We rely a lot of times on our listening audience. And I really want to thank everyone for the time that they take to just quickly retweet something like that. I know it's uh, it's a moment out of your time to go do that, but it really means a lot to us when you do those things. So thank you so much for those things that you do. I want to shout out our show voicemail line. It's one 388 4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. And remember, all these things are in our show notes and on our website. We try to make this information as accessible to you as possible because we want you to feel a part of our show. You are important to us. Our next episode, Jim, we're going to wrap up our exploration of Frank Miller. And we wanted to do this as kind of a big celebration of 300 sh- 350 shows of Raging Bullets. W- these are some stories we've always wanted to do on the podcast. The Dark Knight Strikes Again is the one, out of all of them, uh, I'm probably the most interested to talk to you about. Because I had a certain impression of it when I originally read it. And I'm very curious to see what your impression, because you, I don't know how much baggage you came into this with as far as knowing what you knew about Strikes Again or the feelings you had about I'm very curious to see your thoughts on this story. And please do not say anything now, because you've been, you've been so good about it. I think this is going to be a very unique and interesting discussion, although you blew me away with Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm very curious. This will be a one-episode one, We're gonna because uh, it's only three issues. So um, I, I think it's going to be a meaty discussion, but we will we'll marathon it if we have to. Um, and then after that, we're going to jump back into regular continuity. So that will be next week's episode. We will see you then. Bye. 
Flying through space and time A thousand different lifetimes Faded for love and loss And incredibly clear sidelines Swinging your mace around Such a practical loud look Helping the JSA And occasionally supporting your own book Hawk man, hawk man Eagle eyes can't see Hawk man, your plan Then in guard or Egyptian Working so hard to thwart You and Hawker's mission The odds are not on your side And danger seems to stack up Things will be so much easier if you 